I think so. Yeah, it's just, uh, it says it's <clears throat> redirecting me to the streaming page. Oh, but it's taking me to the test. <laughs> Oh, sad. 
<clears throat> Alrighty. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. My name is Muhammad Ghazmi, and I'll be your host for today's event. For I would I would like to welcome everyone today 
two of our careers panel. Uh, this weekend, we are blessed to have professionals from various fields join us and share their invaluable experiences. This is an excellent opportunity for us to see professional growth and learn uh, from those who excel in their respective careers. Uh, so we are really fortunate to have our lovely panelists here today. As well, they will also be answering any relevant questions that you may have. So feel free to ask them using the chat feature on Zoom or comment section on YouTube and Facebook. Today, we will start off with, um, with experts from the computer science, followed by law, ending with engineering, inshallah. Before that, inshallah, we'll begin with the recitation of the Holy Quran by Ali Yahya. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حاميم والكتاب المبين إنا أنزلناه في ليلة مباركة إنا كنا منذرين فيها يفرق كل أمر حكيم أمرا من عندنا إنا كنا مرسلين رحمة من ربك إنه هو السميع العليم رب السماوات والأرض وما بينهما إن كنتم موقنين لا إله إلا هو يحيي ويميت ربكم ورب آبائكم الأولين بل هم في شك يلعبون فارتقب يوم تأتي السماء بدخان مبين يغشى الناس هذا عذاب أليم رب نكشف عنا العذاب إنا مؤمنون أنا لهم الذكرى وقد جاءهم رسول مبين ثم تولوا عنه وقالوا معلم مجنون إنا كاشف العذاب قليلا إنكم عائدون يوم نبطش البطشة الكبرى إنا منتقمون ولقد فتنا قبلهم قوم فرعون وجاءهم رسول كريم أن أدوا إلى عباد الله إني لكم رسول أمين وأن لا تعلوا على الله إني آتيكم بسلطان مبين وإني عثت بربي وربكم أن ترجمون وَإِنْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا لِي فَاعْتَزِلُونَ فَدَعَا رَبَّهُ أَنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ قَوْمٌ مُجْرِمُونَ فَأَسْرِي بِعِبَادِي لَيْلًا إِنَّكُمْ مُتَّبَعُونَ وَاتْرُكِ الْبَحْرَ رَهْوًا إِنَّهُمْ جُنْدٌ مُغْرَقُونَ كم تركوا من جنات وعيون وزروع ومقام كريم ونعمة كانوا فيها فاكهين كذلك وأورثناها قوما آخرين فما بكت عليهم السماء والأرض وما كانوا منظرين ولقد نجينا بني إسرائيل من العذاب المهين من فرعون إنه كان عاليا من المسرفين ولقد أخترناهم على علم على العالمين 
وآتيناهم من الآيات ما فيه بلاء مبين إن هؤلاء لا يقولون إن هي إلا موتتنا الأولى وما نحن بمنشرين فآتوا بآبائنا إن كنتم صادقين أهم خير أم قوم تبع والذين من قبلهم أهلكناهم إنهم كانوا مجرمين وما خلقنا السماوات والأرض وما بينهما لاعبين ما خلقناهما إلا بالحق ولكن أكثرهم لا يعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد جزاك الله برضو أليف for that wonderful recitation now we'll be starting with our computer science experts for this career path. We have Hamza Jafar and Nayesh Alkhani. Hamza is a computer science graduate from Ryerson University. He has gained experience as a software developer at McKenzie Investments, Environment Canada, and is currently a part of Conrad Group. Nayesh Alkhani is a graduate of the University of Toronto, majoring in computer science and linguistics. She is currently working as a DevOps engineer at Intel designing streamlined infrastructure systems for development teams. Thank you both for joining us today. We're incredibly grateful to have you here. Let's get, let's get straight into it. Uh, Brother Hamza, uh, what made you pick this profession? Um, for me, I've been, I've been always interested in computer uh, parts and computer just software and everything. Um, so again, I, I've, I've always loved like software development, just programming languages in general since like high school um, and stuff. So it was just like the path I chose because computer science is really strong for software development. Mm. And that was like my area of like uh, interest. Um, it, for me, it started off from, uh, what, what was it? Uh, programming, like software, like game development. That was where I, I, I picked up the interest in programming. And then it just led to like uh, websites, backend development and all that. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. Uh, Naish, uh, how about you? How did you get into this field? Um, so I was someone who was tinkering out around with computers a lot since I was a kid, uh, but I wasn't really into computer science as a field until I got into university. Um, I mean, I'd done programming before. Um, I'd taken computer science in high school, but I wasn't really serious about it as my primary career path until I got into university and I thought I wanted to be a cognitive scientist. Um, cognitive science is this uh, interdisciplinary program uh, that involves computer science, but also other things, neurology, psychology, philosophy. Um, but as I got deeper into it, I, I realized that what I enjoyed most about my program was the programming side of things, the looking at how computers work, how we want uh, to teach computers how to think, uh, how we want to use computers to model uh, the human mind, um, just in general, the applications of computers in the world. So I figured, why not just focus on that? Um, and then... Uh, I, I also majored in linguistics on the side kind of because it helps with my, uh, uh, my vision of using computers to apply, uh, using computer science uh, in applications of real world problems. So uh, that's why I ended up in computer science and linguistics together. Mm -hmm. For sure. Interesting. For sure. Um, I'm interested to know what would you say is the most rewarding and most difficult part about being in this field? And I'll give this to uh, Sister Nishko. Uh, I think the most rewarding is probably that you can take a problem, even an ill-defined problem, and you can, you can dig into it. You can really dig deep into it and try to figure out, A, what the problem is, and B, how to solve it, and C, how to make your solution efficient. Um, uh, so, so that's really rewarding because you can, you can take a problem from start to finish and that the, the solution can be entirely your creation. It's what you're putting out into the world. Uh, one of the most difficult parts is if you're working in, in like the field of computer science, like if you're working in, in, in industry, um, the computer science industry tends to be very, um, 
how should I put it? They're not very good at work-life balance. So they reward you when you uh, spend all of your time doing your work and producing amazing results, but it becomes, it, there's a, there's very much a culture of this has to be your entire life. And like, what? You don't do programming puzzles on the weekend for fun? So uh, it, it's difficult trying to um, enjoy uh, being in the field, but also not having it take over your entire life. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, Brother Hamza, do you share a similar perspective? What's been the best? Yeah. Work so, yeah, so the most rewarding part, I guess, is definitely when you see the product that you just created. Um, I've been on a lot of teams and seeing the mobile apps that we created, the the software, like the computer software we created, it's always like the best part of the project and just computer science in general. Um, something challenging, I guess, would be like, yeah, like you said, there's always in computer science, you're always learning and there's always new technology and you always got to be like uh, the, I guess, the knowledgeable of the newest technology. The old stuff always like gets old, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always important to just keep, uh, and especially for interviews, you always want to be ahead of the, I guess, the curve. So you always want to just maintain like the knowledge of the, of the new generation. So that's, I guess, the most challenging um, part of computer science. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to follow up on that, I'm curious if you could do it all over again. Is there anything you would change? Uh, Brother Hamza first. Yeah, um, for me, I would focus on a lot on uh, practicing like algorithm problems. Because for me, I've always been interested in just the uh, algorithm software development part of computer science. Because there's, there's a whole broad, like computer science, you could do, it's not just software development, you could do like QA, you could do product manager. There's a lot of different fields you go into. For me, I was always, I only went into it for software development. So that's where I focused. And um if I would start from the beginning, I would just read more uh, software development books, um, algorithm books, and especially just practice a lot of lead code. Because during, I guess, when I graduated and that's when I started looking for jobs, that's when I started looking at lead code. But if I looked at it um, during university, it would have been, I guess, I would have had like a bigger advantage compared to like uh, everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, same question to um, Sister Naish. So I got into computer science a little bit late, like I said. Um, so, or... I got into it seriously rather late. So I think uh, something that I would have enjoyed doing more is um, more the academic side of kind of theoretical computer science. I think if you want, if you're, if you're at all serious about getting into, for example, a master's program in computer science, you have to really start thinking early as with any uh, graduate program. You really have to start committing early to uh, going out and looking for those research opportunities, looking out for, for places where you can do more in your classes rather than just, you know, uh, getting all the uh, test cases running for whatever project you're working on, just submitting something that works rather than going above and beyond really impressing your professors. I think if I'd done more of that, I'd be in a better position now to um, jump into the graduate world. Um, I'm fine, like at the moment with just working, but uh, definitely when I decide to do my master's, I think I'm going to do more I'm going to have to do more than people who did that sort of research academic side of things while they were doing their bachelors. Mm -hmm. That makes it a little tricky. Yeah, for sure. I think that balance is definitely needed. Um, I So Sister Nash just asked you another question. Um, being a Muslim woman, how would you say that's affected your career uh, if it has in, its fir in, first, in the first place? Um. I think that there are kind of two ways of looking at this. There's the um, are Muslim women discriminated against side of it. And there's the like, does being a Muslim woman help me? And on the discrimination side, I think, especially like being in Toronto um, and just interviewing in Toronto jobs uh, has helped because Toronto is very diverse and that's not really an issue. Um, and also just in general, when you're in a STEM field, it tends to be very much a meritocracy. So if you prove that you are good at your job, um, then that's really all that matters. There are going to be, there's going to be the odd person who's just got it out for you, but that happens regardless of whether you're a hijabi. So um, I think that is something that Muslim women in this field, but also any other STEM field should definitely not worry about like, go out and be you, just whatever you decide to do, be good at it. Cause that's what really matters. Um, the, the other side of it, like the, do, does it help out? I think, I think 
being a Muslim woman gives me uh, the sort of values and the sort of principles that make sure that I don't lose myself. Um, it's very easy to get caught in the rat race and the uh, uh, just go, go, go and commit <coughs> everything within you to this, like being the top engineer on your team or whatever. Um, but I think knowing that there's like a higher, there's a higher purpose, there are, there are more important values in my life helps me uh, separate that out and kind of um, know how much to commit of myself while also still doing an excellent job while still being a valuable member of my team. Um, but, you know, being reasonable about everything. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Uh, similar question, uh, Brother Hamza, uh, coming from a Muslim male background, uh, what is your perspective on this? Um, for me, I never, for, yeah, I guess in terms of like discrimination or anything, I never felt in any, any, any way like that. Um, I've had, I've had um, admins at my work at Environment Canada offer to like book me rooms because they saw me praying in my people. So I think, in, especially in Toronto, everyone's like very respectful. Uh, it's very diverse everywhere I've been at. Um, in terms of just like the Muslim, how it affected me, um, I don't even think I, I, like it's, it's, it's that relatable because at the end of the day, it's just it's a STEM field and just like trying to learn as much as possible and just trying to be the best as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think any Muslim like perspective had anything to uh, affected my career at all. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Okay, okay. Uh, so, Brother Hamza, just to hit it back off you, um, there's another question that I'm sure many of uh, the viewers and also computer science uh, people might be wondering, and that's, what is the best career advice you've ever received? Um, like, I, like I said earlier, when I was like, if I had to do it, I would definitely read the book, uh, Cracking the Coding Interview. Um, I had this, I got this book first year in university, uh, my professor gave it to me, and it's been for me, because again, I love it algorithms and just soft development the programming aspect of computer science um uh, this book is probably the most important book i've read uh that and like data structures and algorithm another book um so i guess my career the best career advice i had was uh just practice a lot of problems on the code because uh, most interviews for software development uh will just grab this bunch of questions on the code and instead of just trying to find a solution look for the most efficient solution because it's usually easy to find a solution it's just uh the efficiency it might just not be as good Mm -hmm. um so for me that that was my the best advice i've got and i got that advice actually from my cousin that's all there's that for sure that's amazing mashallah um uh sister Nish, uh I, I assume that you've probably heard a bunch of advice in your career in your um throughout your career what is the best that you've received can i give two answers yeah sure go ahead uh so there's there's the one advice i got from one of my uh, cs profs back in the day and his advice or his his kind of favorite phrase was not all mathematicians are good computer scientists but all good computer scientists are good mathematicians and that kind of got me into this like if you want to be especially a good theoretical computer scientist you have to really understand math you have to have you don't just necessarily have to have a mathematical mind but it would really help and you can't um you can't discount the importance of calculus of linear algebra like you think those are just courses that you are forced to take in first and second year and everyone just wants to get the mark and go and pass on but really it really matters for you to have that strong mathematical foundation later um, in your computer science career um, and then the other side of it is I once heard that so someone say that you should never do computer science as a career you should consider computers a tool that you use to do something else so don't think of uh, you know, programming as your job, but rather programming as a tool that you use to do whatever it is that you really care about. And that means that when you go out in the world to look for a job, don't just look at what kind of programming you're doing, look at uh, what that company is actually doing. And is that company, like, is that kind of work something that you really want to contribute to? And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, oh, yes, therefore you must be a biomedical engineer or you have to be curing cancer or whatever. But it does mean that you should, you should consider this, like, for example, uh, knowing how to write C++ as a, a tool in your toolbox, but then go out and look for the right kind of problem to solve with that tool. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Definitely. That definitely. That's some amazing advice. Um, just before we move on to our uh, next portion of the panel, would you guys like to say any like final remarks about the industry? Any more advice? I guess 
Um, I was, I'll just say that like in computer science, again, you have a lot of options. There's a lot of different uh, fields you go into, like sub subfields, um, like from data engineers to like software development to just managers, product managers. Um, so you do have a lot of options. And then there's also like every company needs computer science. Well, not most companies need to are moving digital. So computer science is a big um, portion of like uh, a lot of teams in these companies. So whether you want to work in financial companies or uh, just soft development companies or health health uh, clients, there is a lot of options. So I think right now it's one of the most like uh, required profession, um, like the the best job, I guess, the most hires. Um, and it's comp- It's usually competitive uh, pay, so there's just that to add on. Um, so I recommend everyone do computer science. Okay, okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, okay, I guess uh, we'll move on. Thank you for your, both uh, for this illuminating discussion. I'm sure all the computer science students have learned a lot. Inshallah, we will be uh, taking our audience questions now. I think they've been eagerly waiting. Um, so for the first question we have is, what is one experience you've had that sums up your entire comms Um Okay, so I'll think you... I think I missed the end of that question. Sure, no problem. I'll say it again. What is one experience you've had that sums up your entire computer science career? Um, I'll let um, Brother Hamza, if you want to start. Um, a recent experience I've had. Um, so I like to be uh, usually optimistic when I'm, when I'm doing, because um, I, I do a lot of estimates for my, for my coworkers. So usually I, I get an assignment and I, I tell them like how long it's going to take us to do. But recently I got advice um, to... Um, always like double the the time you think is gonna happen and add even more time, um, and I think that kind of sums it up because I usually try to be optimistic and I usually always fall behind sometimes, um, like uh, in terms of like uh, like completing the assignment on time. So I think that that experience where you just like always double your um your your estimate is was really good for me, um, but like one experience it's hard it's hard to define. Okay. Uh, Sunesh, would you like to go? Sure. Uh, just a comment. It's funny that you mentioned that because I was just recently talking to someone at work about multiplicative factors. This idea that you should always, multi- every person has some multiplicative factor that they should double or triple or whatever the time that it takes to do a project. But And I definitely have the same, same trouble myself. But um, I think I would say one of the most uh, emblematic computer science things that ha- that's happened to me is that sometimes things just fall into your lap and you shouldn't skip an opportunity because you think it's not for you. Um, and my, when I was an intern, I worked under someone who worked on uh, something called FPGAs, um, which are is, it's a particular kind of hardware similar to CPUs and GPUs. And uh, it, uh, my, my manager was someone who was working on a paper on some extremely specific uh, method of using FPGAs for accelerating matrix multiplication for ap- AI applications, like extremely niche topic. Not at all what I what I was an expert in myself, but he mm-hmm. offered for me to work on the paper with him. And I was like, sure, why not? And I ended up getting my name on a paper out of it. It was something that was kind of weird because um, I did not go into that internship expecting that I would end up kind of submitting a paper uh, but it turns out that it, if, if an opportunity comes at you jump at it because it might end up being something that is really rewarding and comes it comes in handy later in life even if it doesn't seem on the surface something that that is really up your alley okay okay for sure definitely um so we've talked about one of the experience that sums up your entire career but I'm curious to know for both of you, what is the most rewarding experience that you guys had? Um, Sister Naish, I'll let you go first. Uh, the most rewarding experience. This is tricky. Um, I think uh, this isn't really one particular experience, but in general, it's really rewarding seeing the impact that my work has on other people. And it's not even necessarily at work. Sometimes it's things outside of work, things that I do like um, as extracurriculars uh, that I see like I have the ability to take a programming problem or like a computer problem that I'm not even that familiar with, but I can go in and tinker with it 
and make it work and help someone else uh, solve a problem that they had no idea how to approach. Um, having the computer science background makes it makes me the person who's able to do that. It's really nice because the, there can be a problem that seems intractable, but uh, if you have the the like experience and you have the knowledge and you have the willingness to kind of just work at it until it's resolved, then you can end up really helping someone and that can be really rewarding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, for you, Brother Hamza? Um, so again, for me, the most rewarding aspect of it was um, seeing my the product that we, me, me and my team created at, in production and like used by live customers. Um, so recently, after like a year of working our, on our product, um, I can't really talk too much about it because I'm doing DA, but the product went live and we had like big celebrities use it. And like, it's really cool to see like I have access to all these celebrities emails and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But it's really cool to see like the customers who are using it and now it's in like the tens of thousands of customers are, are daily using this, this product. And mm -hmm. it was created by me and my team for the past year. So that aspect of the, the work is probably the most rewarding for me. Mm -hmm. Mashallah, for sure. Um, uh, and I hope to see the product soon, uh, be streamlined. Um, so for the next question, um, a time when what you had to do contradicted Islam and, ha and how you navigate the situation. So have you guys felt this? So I'll let Brother Hamza go first. Um, so my company usually on Fridays, they have this, uh, like a chill with the team. Um, so they usually drink beers and they, it's like a casual Friday um, for us. And then I was in a, because I started this company through like work from home. So I've been always working from home. I've never really met anyone, but they've had this thing where it's like they just drink beers together on Zoom calls. Um, so I just joked around with them. Um, well, I told them straight up, like, I, I obviously can't do that. Um, and then no one really has like a big problem. They, they ask me like, oh, questions about it, but that, so that, that's usually where it ends. Um, mm -hmm. Again, usually in these companies, they're very diverse. Uh, so I'm not the only Muslim there. So they've usually heard this thing from, from other people before. Um, so yeah, it was just like usually it's something like that. Okay. And, uh, Sister Naish, how about you? I've, I've had a lot of situations similar to Hamza's, I think, where, uh, you know, there's some social events that you don't want to get involved with. Um, but you also don't want to be the, uh, um, killjoy of the group. So I think it's important to, um, you know, find the find the social events that you can go to with a good conscience and go to those to to make it clear that yeah you're a fun person but you also have boundaries um and then the other thing is and a lot of this is under nda but uh sometimes there will be things that you know you're you're in a company and they're working on things that you're not entirely comfortable with on a moral on uh, from a moral standpoint um and for me i try to explicitly distance myself from those projects because I'm like yeah if this is going to be used for such and such thing that I don't agree with and like I know my mom would not approve of I'm just not going to get mixed up with it um, and I think there are going to be situations when that's harder to do and maybe the, the extreme move would be to find another job but uh, it's definitely something that has to be kept in mind at all times mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for sure um, and uh, what, how has COVID affected your work-life balance? I know that obviously uh, computer science regard, like requires you to use a computer, obviously. So uh, I'm curious to know. I'll, uh, I'll give it to you, Sister Nish. Go ahead. Um, well, I do a lot of phone calls. My, my ears are really tired of having earphones in them. Um, it's difficult because a lot of times if you want to uh, get a point across with someone or if you want to resolve some conflict it's much easier to do it if, if you're face to face and you can kind of see their reactions and you can try to work with them on a human level to get them to see your point of view and that's much harder to do over the phone or over text um, and the other thing is that uh, uh, like computer scientists tend to be kind of a work at odd hours bunch. I don't know if Hamza has the same experience, but you'll see people putting in code submissions at like 1 a.m. and it's just ridiculous. And it's hard not to be pulled into that. Um, this like, oh, well, someone's submitting a question for you to answer on chat, like during dinner, should you answer? No, don't answer. You don't want to give them the wrong idea. Um, and I think COVID has definitely made that easier because everyone is just on their computers all the time now, rather than, you know, you leave work and that's it. You leave your work at work. Mm. So it's just a matter of 
even though your your room and your your work have your like home home room and your work room have merged into the same place you still have to maintain those mental boundaries mm -hmm. for sure and brother hamza how about you uh, i'm usually the software developer that submits at 1 a.m <laughs> um <laughs> But yeah, so for me, um, COVID, I started the job during COVID, so I, I didn't really uh, meet any, I haven't, I've yet to meet anyone in my team um, in person. But for me, I, I say overall, it's been like positively affected. I like the flexibility of working from home, waking up like a little later than you'd, you'd wake up when you're trying to commute. Um, uh, during meetings, for me, it's been like, it's been really like chill. Um, I, I've been able to get all my points across. Uh, um, work was like understood easily. Um, and again, the idea, like I could work, I could work at 1 a.m. <laughs> was been really good for me because I'm not like the, I don't like working too much uh, during the afternoon. Um, so having the flexibility of being able to work later at night with when the house is quiet, that's the, I think that the worst part about work from home is usually I have brothers and like sisters and my family. It's just annoying to uh, during meetings. Um, but, but again, during the later shifts, uh, it's been, it's been good. Um, so yeah, I think that the only con again is just uh, not being able, not being able to socially interact with your coworkers, uh, like building the relationships and just like networking more. Um, but other than that, I personally would love to work from home. <laughs> Hope it stays. Nice for Ramadan, though. I will say that. Yeah, and then for this Ramadan, it's gonna be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, so, uh, so one thing I want to ask, actually, just a follow up on this question is that obviously you like flexibility of hours. You know, obviously some um, uh, sister. Uh, you had said that you left work at work and obviously you just uh, continue on with your day. So I'm curious to know, how do you guys deal with like a burnout, working out too much and being like fully exhausted? Uh, brother, you can go ahead first. Um, so for me, I, I don't program that much during the day these, these days, like these couple of months. So because right now I spend most of the time in meeting and then they, they, you do get burned off from the meetings. Um, so usually, again, my day usually starts from like nine to like one to two. I'm using meetings, uh, just like, uh, like assigning tickets to other developers. And during the, those time, like during those, I do, I definitely get burned out and I usually try to space the meetings. I, I usually ask them like, like, so I'm not going to, from meeting to meeting. Um, and my, my company is very flexible. So I could take like, an, like if I need to go for a walk, I usually afternoon walk or like a 30 minute break whenever I want, I usually do it. Um, so I've yet to get burned out. Again, I'm still new to like, like the, I'm just, I'm just recently graduated. So like, it's only been my first year working. So I'm still like eager to like program more. Mm. So I haven't really been affected by any burnout yet. Okay. And how about you, sister? Um, I think one of the most important things is communication. I and mean, everyone's working from home and everyone's uh, suffering from the same troubles, uh, you know, too many meetings, too much programming, et cetera. Um, and I think it really helps to speak with your coworkers, with whoever it is uh, who is relevant and be like, yeah, it's, it would be nice to take an afternoon off or to do a meeting that is like, you know, a fun meeting, do Scribble IO or something. Um, or just in general, take time to uh, reboot your brain uh, rather than this constant go, 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 go. Uh, I think um, everyone will understand and everyone will appreciate uh, you being the person that says, okay, I think we're all just burnt out. We need to take a break. And mm -hmm. if everyone's doing it, it's excellent because it's, there's no feeling of guilt, like, oh, that other person is working and I'm not. Everyone is taking this um, reasonable amount of time to recharge and then going back into it. And also, if you have a good number of vacation days, use them. Don't leave them all to the end of the year. Like, and, and don't be afraid to like take a day off or take a half day off for eat or whatever. Do it because you need to um, make time for what's important for you. Mm -hmm. So I think one thing that people are that would like to break into industry would like to know is like networking. So you mentioned there's challenges like for, with socializing from an Islamic perspective. So I'm just wondering uh, how important would you say that networking or socializing is in this field considering um, uh, like sister, uh, you had said that you dial a lot of phone calls. So um, I'll, 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 I'll let you take over this question first. Um, so Networking, in terms of finding a job, networking is important insofar as it's really nice to have a friend who works at a company who can recommend you. Um, it's crazy how many people get jobs like that. Like sometimes you'll see someone who has a job that they're not even that well suited for, but they had an in, so they got in. That happens a lot. And if you don't get a job, 
don't think it's because you weren't qualified. Often it's because someone else had an inside uh, person. Um, so there's a lot of that uh, playing nepotism favorites type thing mm -hmm. going mm -hmm. on in the industry, which happens everywhere, but it's especially hard when it's so competitive. But um, in terms of like, you know, building connections with your coworkers, with people outside of work, but other people in your field, um, it doesn't, the, the context doesn't really matter. Like it, if you think you have to, you know, go to a, a, a wine and greet to be able to meet people who can get you jobs, don't think that. What's important is that in the opportunities that you have in the career fairs or the, or the panels or the, uh, you know, university lectures or the whatever it is that you find yourself at, make your mark. So ask intelligent questions, be attentive, don't be on your phone the whole time. Um, show that you're someone who is thinking deeply about problems and cares deeply about what's being said and just show yourself for the amazing person that you are and that will be enough to draw people towards you and help you become successful mm -hmm. uh brother hunter yeah i definitely agree with everything she said um um you could also network like we have a lot of islamic um people in, in, in these companies. Um, so you, um, there's, you're not, you're not going to be the only one that like can't drink or can't like do all these, all these social activities um, with your peers. So you, you can still network with those and you can always network again, everyone, I feel like in Toronto, especially everyone knows like um, how Muslims are. So there isn't like that where if I can't drink, that doesn't mean I can't be like in the, in the zoom call, you know? So I, I'm still interacting with them. Um, I'm still networking with everyone. Uh, I think it's important to have LinkedIn and stuff so for like for if you're looking for jobs. Uh, uh, so I'm another person to message you're interested in. For example, my company is very referral based. So even if you're the brother Hamza, I think your working is important, and you could always like. Uh... Sorry, you just cut off. Oh, last... Can you hear me now? <laughs> Repeat. It's okay. It's okay. Repeat that like last ten seconds. Yeah. So. Can... I... Um, so I was saying that my company is the most important, uh, like for looking, for looking for a job to like work at something, a company like mine, they take referrals a lot more serious than just a normal application, even if you're the most qualified person. Mm -hmm. Um, so referrals are important and networking is important to get these positions. Um, I would recommend like always like interacting with like LinkedIn, um, having like a good uh, profile there mm -hmm. and just like interacting with people. Like if you see, if you're interested in their company, just try to throw them a message, um, just try to make connections to that. Um, and then again, just like going to these career events, uh, networking with like uh, HR and just anyone that's like hiring managers is always good. Um, and I just, again, the most important is like in your mosque, around your mosques and just like in your community, mm -hmm. there's a lot of like software developers, Muslims. So you, you, you will find the connections to that as well. Um, so yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, so the next question we have is, um, Okay, yeah. so uh, it's really good for you, Brother Hamza, but could you explain, uh, expand more on what a typical day is like in this field, or I guess for you, typical night? I'll let you go first, Brother Hamza. Um, yeah, so for me, I usually wake up at 9. Um, well, I have my first meeting at 9, so I wake up at 8.50. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I do my first meeting, and then um, the, so in, in usually in software development, you have like scrum meetings, and we're just talking about exactly basically what we're going to do today. Um I'm a, I'm a software developer, but I'm also like rep, like team lead. So I usually see the tickets I have. And if there's anybody, any other software developer in my team that's not, doesn't have enough work, I usually assign them work in the morning. And then I spend the rest of the day, the, the first half of the day, usually in meetings, just discussing with the client and like product managers mm -hmm. what they want. And then just like creating requirements for the, for the project. Mm -hmm. And then I usually just the, the better half of the day, I usually spend it programming. Um, sometimes I miss a few hours, which is, which is when I redo them at night. Uh, cause again, we're, we're quite flexible in our team. Um, but if you're not, it's usually just like better half a day after, the, after all the meetings are finally done. I just spend most of the day just programming, finding solutions to, um, the assignments or the tickets I get, um, and just trying to try to get them all done. And then, and then, um, just like QA to like test it as well. Um, and that's just like a typical day. Just spend the, the morning half in meetings and then the afternoon just like programming alone. Okay. And uh, how about you, Sister Neish? Um, So for me, it depends on the day. Some days are more meeting heavy than others. 
But in general, my days will consist of a mix of meeting with my own team, meeting with people outside of my team, uh, who are usually the people who are making requests to us. Um, sometimes meeting with, uh, you know, like one-on-ones with managers or, or other people to hash out a particular problem. And then oftentimes we'll do um, like something like pair programming or like pair debugging. So someone will bring up in a meeting, oh, I'm seeing a problem in such and such area. Has anyone seen something like this? And I'll go, oh yeah, I've seen something like that. Let's work through it together. So someone will share their screen. We'll try to dig through it together, um, craft a problem together. That's really nice. It's, it's really rewarding because you end up developing a, a, a solution that is constructed out of the expertise of both people. Um, and then sometimes it's just, I'm working on my own projects or whatever tickets come up uh, at my, at my at my job, we have kind of two phases of work. We have the huge projects that are like months long and we have what we call a KTBR, keep the business running. So it's whatever little projects, little little errors, bugs that come up during the day that you have to handle. Um, and it's, you have to keep a balance between those two. You have to make sure to get your long-term projects done, but also satisfy the customers who are submitting those daily bugs. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. Um, so the next question we have is, um... Okay. Uh, ask. Uh, so, what school? So, what schools did you guys go to, and what was your experience uh, with their programs in Kamsa? So, I'll let um, Sister Nisha can go first. Uh, so, I went to U of T St. George. That's the main University of Toronto campus. Um, <clears throat> the computer science department there is very strong. Uh, it's got a really good faculty. They are. They do somewhat tend towards the academic side of computer science, um, especially in higher years. Like in general, UFD is really good if you want to get into academia, if you want research experience. Um, they have a co-op program, which is called PEY, Professional Experience Year, which is after third year, you take 12 to 16 months to work in one company. And then you go back after that for your fourth year. So that that is... Huh both good and bad. I mean, the other system you'll see is the Waterloo system, which is you do one semester of study and one semester of work, pros and cons to each. Um, I think U of D is good if you, um, if you're fine with the large class sizes, because there is that. Um, but it's also really nice because there are some really amazing professors. And if you are the kind of person who goes to office hours, who digs deep into problems, and who enjoys solving the uh, like high level of theoretical problems, U of D is great for you. If you're someone who likes more of the uh, like, um, I don't know, group based approach, there are a few courses that are like that, but not so many and they're not, they're not as good as one would like. So it's, it's definitely based on what do you want to do in computer science? Do you want to do more like the software development side or do you want to do more of the, um, theoretical computer science slash AI slash vision processing sort of side. Okay. And uh, how about you, brother Hamza? Yeah. So I went to Ryerson university. Um, I did, I attended the, there for the uh, co-op program and I think they, they have a really good co-op, um, I guess, overall program there. A lot of, um, a lot of good companies are like are tied to them. Um, that's where I, I, I got my McKenzie investments internship. Um, so, so in uh, uh, Ryerson, is, they have a lot of like a lot of variety of uh, programs. So, like a lot of variety of courses. Sorry. So you could do whether if you're interested in like specializing in software development, they have that option. So as long as you take like a certain amount of software development courses, um, throughout your four years, um, or if or if it's like I guess yeah, if you want to go more into AI, you have that option as well. Um, I think overall it, it was a good program. It, it wasn't I got, I, for sure it's probably not as hard as Saint George, <laughs> but it was called uh, overall if you're if you're into like practical and theory it, it is a great a great program and a lot of like amazing professors and the class sizes are smaller so you do interact with the professors on where um mm-hmm. so that was just my experience there okay and uh for sure, for sure just to get a uh, bounce off of that and somewhat relating to the second last question um and i think this might be our last question uh keeping in time in mind is in regards to grades so obviously you guys both went to respective schools and you guys obviously i assume did um a good plentiful amount of networking. So I'm just curious to know as to how pivotal marks are uh, in terms of getting a job or in the field. So uh, Brother Hamza, I'll, I'll let you go first. I think, to, I think 
you're, it is possible like, for sure it's always possible to get a job with like a, low, a lower gpa um i think during your first job it's probably the most important your grade will matter um as long as you secure the interview usually and you're like you do a good interview I, I, grades i think are only good for securing the interview it's not really for hiring my, from my experience um so for my first like internships my grades definitely helped me uh get them because I, I had no connections for those so if you're looking for a job without any like networking, I think grade, grades is important. But if you're able to get the interview with through networking, um, and you're like maybe your grades are not as good, you're able you're able to like bounce back if you have a good uh, depending on job. For example, like software development jobs, if you're able to solve these like software development jobs in interview, I mean questions in the interview, uh, the grades won't matter that much because that's that's what they're looking for. Um, so I guess if it's like your first job without any networking, grades are important. But if you're able to find network network a connection of networks, um. I, you could like ignore grades for a bit. Mm-hmm. And uh, how about you, Sister H? I definitely agree about the uh, marks helping you get interviews, especially I, uh, at Intel, where I also did my internship. Um, if you have a GPA above maybe, I don't know, 3.6, 3.7, you basically get an interview no matter what. Um, but what they really care about for actually hiring you is to know that you can program. So if, even if you have a 4.0 GPA, but you can't solve a you, know, you can't write a simple for loop, then obviously they're not going to hire you. Um, if you are interested in doing graduate studies, though, you definitely don't want to ignore the importance of marks, especially in your last two years. Mm-hmm. Getting good marks in your last two years is crucial for being able to get into a good master's program. But of course, um, like Hamza said, there's always that, you know, make sure you you crack that interview because being able to look at a problem, explain how you're solving it and then actually solve it is the most important thing for getting a job, especially when you've just graduated or if you're an internship uh, applicant. Okay, sounds good. Um, I think we can ha- I think we can squeeze one more question. Um, one second. Okay, so just a follow-up question. How do you best prepare for your academic journey, like getting good marks and balancing everything in your university lifestyle? So just, uh, it's kind of like a concluding sentence to all the things you guys have said. Uh, so I'll let Sister Nish, you go first. So I would say the most important thing is to prioritize um, and plan in advance. So figure out in advance what you want to do with your life, what you're interested in doing, if you want to go all the way to a PhD or if you don't, if you want to work in industry all your life. Um, or if you want to like, I don't know, make a ton of money and retire early, (laughs) figure that out early um, and then plan accordingly. And then definitely uh, look for people who've done similar things or who have the the time and the insight to guide you. Finding mentors is really crucial. For me, I was lucky enough to find mentors during my internship, but you might find them at university, you might find them amongst your family, you might find them at your mosque, wherever, just make sure like you understand you're not doing this alone. There are lots of people who are doing the same thing as you. So go out and look for those people and try to take on the world together. Mm-hmm. And Brother Hamza, how about you? Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, you should definitely prioritize and plan ahead. Um, so if you're in a university and you see like you're going to be free for a summer and like you, there's a chance you could take an internship, even if it's your second year and you think you're not qualified, um, I don't think it, it usually doesn't matter, especially for internships. Um, you could go into usually for my cases, you you could do internships with zero like zero experience, zero programming knowledge, and usually you'll find mentors that are willing to teach you. Um, like for example, my first internship at McKenzie, I had no idea. Like I didn't touch Python, but I, I did obviously like the Java and other other languages. Um, so I went there with zero experience in Python, and I was able to learn everything there. So like, don't be afraid to enter an internship without any knowledge, especially like programming knowledge, because I know that that sometimes scares people. Um, I will say uh, for for academic, definitely again prioritize and just plan ahead. And uh, I had I had another point, but I can't I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Um, okay, I'll just I'll just give it a minute. If anyone on the Zoom uh, or on the panel would like to ask a question, you can unmute yourself and ask uh, one of the respective members. Just please specify who you're asking. I'll just give it a minute. Okay, I'll ask a question. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> but um, I'm curious to know, actually, uh, so I have a lot of friends in computer science. 
Um, and a lot of the time, it's one of those things where it requires a lot of patience. So I'm just curious to know, like in terms of like, even if it's a, something minor, has there anything that's been like frustrating where you're like, oh, I wish this was working out. If it wasn't working out, um, uh, brother Hamza, you can go. Uh, yeah. So recently, last week, I, I had like a bug for uh, for like a production issues that was important for us to fix, and I couldn't figure it out. Like I, it took me like I think two weeks of just like being stuck on this bug, and I tried asking for help, and no one was able to figure it out. It, like it didn't make sense. Although all, nothing made sense from the information they gave us. Um, so I took a break from it and then I did other work and then I went back to it. And then somehow just like one day randomly, I, like I, I figured out why. So like it, it, sometimes it does get frustrating and sometimes it just takes a, a clear head, like reset, like head reset. Um, and just like forgetting about the problem for a bit and then just like looking back to it, like with a fresh mind um, definitely helps. So, yeah. And that's, that's happened a lot of times during my career where I've been stuck on a problem for so long and um it just takes me going, getting away from it and then coming back to it for me to figure out what's the problem. Okay. Um, so Tanisha, I think you have the last say and then we'll move on to the next section. So uh, go ahead. Sure thing. Uh, so I would definitely second the look away from the problem because once you understand a problem thoroughly, staring at it more won't help you, but leaving to go, I don't know, have some cereal or work on something else will let your brain work on it in the background. And then suddenly maybe you'll find, wake up in the middle of night with the solution. Um, the other thing that's really frustrating is highs and bugs or it, intermittent bugs that only happens sometimes. And with those and with anything in computer science, keeping good records is really important. So take notes, take, you know, I don't know, have an Excel sheet, use Jira, whatever it is you use, make sure you have good logging skills because um, the better you can look back on what happened last week, the better you can figure out what you're going to do this week. Okay, sounds good. So thank you once again, brother Hamza and sister Naish. Uh, for that enlightening discussion. I'm sure all our audience learned a lot from that. We're excited to be talking to our lawyers next, uh, Sayed Rizvi and Samar Harib. Uh, Sayed is a corporate, excuse me, brother uh, Brother Sayed is a corporate and securities law uh, lawyer at Milner Thompson LLP. His practice focuses on security law, mergers and acquisitions, venture capital financings, and general uh, corporate and commercial matters. Sayed received his uh, Juris Doctor from Oscar Hall uh, Law School. Uh, prior to which he, he received his Bachelor of Arts from the University of Toronto, majoring in sociology and minoring in English and psychology. A uh, pretty hefty uh, academic career. Uh, Summer Harv is uh, currently in the process of completing her um, article articling at uh, a law firm in Hamilton, Ontario. She obtained her Juris Doctor degree from the University of Windsor and holds a combined honors degree in political science and sociology from McMaster University. Um, during her studies, she fa facilitated discussions with students and communities about social justice issues, concerning minorities, such as challenging Islamophobia in Canada. Also a pretty hefty uh, portfolio. Um, thank you both for joining us today. We're incredibly grateful to have you. Let's get uh, straight into it, Brother Said. Uh, what made you pick this profession? First of all, thank you for having me. Um, so that question I get asked often, and to be honest, it wasn't something I planned on getting into. It wasn't, I didn't go to high school or university thinking I was gonna be a lawyer or apply to law school. It kind of just happened um, by fate. So I was having a conversation with one of my good friends who's a lawyer and you know, just was wondering what I was doing with my sort of uh, undergrad and what I had plans to do afterwards. Um, and he recommended I apply, try it out. And, you know, if I didn't like it, you could always go back to doing what you were doing. So just by chance, I applied. Luckily, I got in and uh, here I am. For sure. And I'll give it to you, Sister Hap. How about you? Um, my journey is a little bit uh, different. I always had the idea of um, going into medicine in high school, but the... At one point in my life, I decided to take a law course. I believe it was grade 11 and that just changed my world completely. I went through a mock trial and we won the mock trial. And I realized that my strengths were writing and public speaking. So I just kind of changed all of my courses in high school and decided to pursue a career in law. Um, but obviously that was just high school going into university. I had that goal, but I didn't study law. Um, I, as you said in the intro, I studied political science and sociology with the intention of going to law school um, thereafter. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so just to follow up on that, what do you love most about being in your field 
And what do you say is the most challenging aspect of it? So I'm still an articling student. I, uh, I'm, I'll be done in three months, I believe. Sure. So far, um, I also did a summer internship a year ago, and now I'm at the same law firm doing my articles. So, so far, my experience has been very diverse. The firm that I'm at does basically every kind of law with the exception of criminal, uh, criminal law and immigration. The most challenging thing I found so far is adopting to the idea of becoming a lawyer. I know that sounds strange, but you know, you're, you've been in school your whole life. Um, you're just focusing on work. You're not really looking at um, you know, studying, so to speak. So you're actually a professional and you have to uh, learn how to differentiate your personal life from your work life. And I found that challenging with COVID uh, specifically. Um, most rewarding has been meeting a lot of people that have you know trust in you and they and they expect you to solve their problems and you have to find ways you have to navigate and figure out okay well how am I going to uh, argue this how am I going to you're going to learn about I learned about beavers last year I learned about um, <laughs> very interesting things so you you really are I find that being a lawyer makes you understand the world around you because not only do you have to understand the law you have to understand almost every kind of field whether it's you know your personal injury you need to know uh what are common injuries in the body um medicine etc so it's very it's a very diverse field and for me just gaining that knowledge has been rewarding in and of itself mm -hmm. for sure definitely um and said yeah, so like summer similarly the most rewarding has definitely been the knowledge and empowerment aspect that comes with you know going to law school um knowing lawyers around you because if you think about it you know everyone that we went to law school with um about 90 percent of them are lawyers they're doing great things you know um and they're going to continue to do great things so you just have a lot of more uh you just have more social capital in that sense and then you understand the society a lot better so um the law that i practice is more solicitor type corporate law so a lot of documents you know a lot of deals um, so that in and of itself is not like very rewarding and fulfilling, but you know, the ability to help my friends and family when they call me with like a legal issue and just being able to point them in the right direction, because it all comes down to trust, right? Like most people feel that if they're going to a lawyer, um, they, the lawyer knows uh, the field inside out, but they have no exposure. So they're at the mercy of whatever they're being told. So, you know, just to kind of bounce ideas off of me. Um, and, you know, sort of get my advice in that regard. So that's like my most fulfilling sort of element being here. And then, you know, our firm contributes to a lot of pro bono work. So, you know, when there's cases that are near and dear to my heart, they'll support me and, you know, being able to take those on and uh, I, I, without cost and, you know, allocating firm resources. So I think that would sum up, you know, the rewarding element of my journey. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, so, but I say just to bounce it off for you again, um, what is, uh, so obviously being a Muslim, how has it impacted your professional experience if it has at all? So, I mean, I've only benefited from being a Muslim because, you know, Alhamdulillah, I've been able to utilize mentors and, you know, build great relationships with Muslims that have been very, very successful. I've all obviously heard the other side of this where, you know, people are discriminated against and they feel that, you know, being a Muslim and um, has affected them. And I mean, I can't speak to that because I, a, I'm not visibly Muslim, like I don't wear the kufi and, you know, I don't have like a very long beard. So, you know, um, maybe I can get away with stuff like that. So I haven't felt the direct impact. Um, so maybe Summer could speak a little bit about that. But other than that, I think with me, like, you know, I, I'm a big believer in merit. Like if you work hard, yeah, you might have to work twice as hard as the person who, you know, checks all the boxes and has all, all the great connections and comes from a great family. But I think if you work hard, then there's nothing stopping you from excelling. It is a very merit-based career. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sister Summer. I'll let you take over. Yeah, I'll echo what Saeed Brisby said. Um, if I don't know anyone that hasn't worked hard and achieved what they want to achieve. It, it really comes down to your effort and the time that you put into your, your craft, right? So, um, the question and can you would you mind repeating the question you uh yeah for sure so um um so being a muslim woman obviously right. how has it affected your professional career 
Absolutely. Um, I actually feel empowered. I don't see any barriers. Um, I actually feel like I'm not a visible minority, um, which honestly, if I can go back to maybe just applying to law school, I thought I was going to be so visible, so um, I would say different than everyone else. Initially, I guess people thought I was an immigrant or um, they presumed that I wouldn't be as capable um, in law school and post law school, but obviously getting to know people and, and working hard really gets you where, where you're supposed to be. So I don't think it's been a challenge. I don't think wearing the hijab has made me any less empowered. I am very, very empowered wearing the hijab, being a lawyer or soon to be lawyer. And I think standing your ground and having your beliefs at the forefront, meaning, for example, in the past, I think, I, I don't remember the people's names that were just speaking, the computer science. Uh, I think Naish was her name. Mm -hmm. She mentioned that um, when she entered the field or when she was pursuing her career, she found that having to avoid certain social environments was key um, to her keeping her beliefs yet still doing the job. And I, I feel like that's definitely the case for me. Obviously, there are a lot of things I can't do, so to speak, drinks with lawyers, etc. But at the same time, if I tell the lawyers, hey, this is not something that I do, I have said that and they were extremely respectful. And even for example, praying, right? I have to go to my articling principal or the other articling principals and say, hey, I, uh, I need a spot to pray. And they were very accommodating. So as long as you put your beliefs at the forefront and you tell them what your limitations are and what you can and can't do, mm -hmm. I feel like there's nothing stopping a Muslim woman or a Muslim male uh, ex excelling in the field of law in any profession actually. Mm -hmm. For sure, it's good to hear that, mashallah, for both people. Um, so my next question um, is, uh, so I know, Sister Sam, so you guys both have placements in law firms. So I was wondering if you can walk us through the whole university process, because obviously you guys have been through it. Um, and how was it like for you to secure a position in the law firms you both currently work for? So uh, you want to you yeah, take a first crack at that? Yeah, go ahead, You're go ahead. much closer to the recruitment than sure. I am. Sure. Sure. Um, well, funny enough, uh, it's a funny story. Say it actually, you're the only person that I spoke to in regards to uh, a career in law, um, finding articling, finding a summer job. I don't know if you recall that conversation uh, in, 20, in 2018, I believe. So the whole process is very, I would say frustrating and um, difficult to say the least. I would say having your grades at the highest that they could be is obviously one aspect, but networking is difficult, especially for Muslims entering this field because there aren't many, unfortunately. There are only a handful, I would say, um, within at least Hamilton. I, I, I live in Hamilton, but there are very, very few Hamilton lawyers. And the time I spoke with Sayed, he told me, you know, you should try the Toronto recruit. And I knew that that wasn't for me because I'm, I'm from Hamilton. So just having a conversation with Sayed about uh, career, a career in law, finding a summer position or articling position was extremely helpful. So he was a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. But with the process itself, um, you know, I would say advice is to, to apply every, everywhere. Um, don't limit yourself to a certain area because there are very few jobs. Um, I would say stick to what your beliefs are, meaning if you want to help the, your own personal community, you don't have to necessarily go to Toronto. You don't have to go to different areas. I, I knew for a fact that the Hamilton community is the community I wanted to assist. So I tried, I applied to every law firm in Hamilton. Um, I went through the interview process, but not only in Hamilton, I did apply to other cities just to get a feel for what to expect. And that certainly helped me in, in, the, uh, in the long run when I accepted the position I'm currently in. So I would say don't limit yourselves uh, when supplying. Make sure your grades are really high and definitely contribute to the law school, meaning groups. Uh, if you can network with people, it doesn't, not, doesn't have to be networking with uh, non-Muslims. It could be with Muslims. It, it doesn't really matter who you're communicating with, but at the end of the day, if you can get your name out there and if you can sort of spark interest with other 
with partners, with, with other individuals like Sayyid, mentors, I would say that's your best bet at finding what you think you like and sort of trying to achieve that by, um, you know, practicing interviewing skills, doing that with other students. So there, there are a lot of steps, but I would say it's not an easy path whatsoever. It's very difficult. Brother Say, do you yeah, want to I, touch on it? Go sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, no, go ahead. You want to touch up on it? Yeah, I, I was just going to echo most of what she said and then just add to the fact that, you know, so when you get into law school, your first year is very important because A, you're adjusting, there's a learning curve, there's actually a grading curve. Um, and these are the grades that all, uh, that most of your employers are going to look at if you do the traditional recruit, right? So it's good to set yourself up from success, for success from a very early stage, right? So getting good notes, reaching out to upper years, and most people are more than happy and willing to help because they've received that mentorship and helped themselves. So it is very difficult. And, you know, now having been on the other side, because I was helping with the recruit at my firm, um, a lot of good people just slip through the cracks because, you know, you only have so much information. Uh, a part of it is, you know, there's so many moving elements. So um, not everyone ends up landing a position through the formal, quote unquote, Toronto recruit. But I don't know one person that I went to law school with that now does not have a jo job unless it's by choice, right? Like some people have decided to go into different industries or you know, take a break for whatever reason, but everyone that wanted a job has a job in a field that they love and enjoy. So there's a lot of opportunity out there, but landing that first job, you do have to kind of go network a lot, have good grades, you know, put in a great application, work on your narrative, like Summer said, get involved in the law school um, and all of these things matter. But, you know, the good news is that there's a lot of people now, especially with Summer's batch, my batch, you know, the batch after us, a lot of Muslims that are doing very good things and, you know, um, getting into great positions that are more than willing to help mentor and push, you know, the future sort of generation forward. For sure. Definitely. Definitely. Um, and so, Brother said, I've seen that you obviously had, uh, like you said, a quite a lot of experience with this. So could you just tell me what a typical day in your profession looks like? So there, like the, the type of law that I'm in, there's no such thing as like a quote unquote typical day. How it usually works on Bay Street and corporate law, I can't speak much for litigation, is you get staffed on files. So what will happen is uh, in any given week, you know, there's files coming in um, and even, you know, shorter, sometimes there's multiple files coming in um, per day. And what happens is lawyers reach out. They're like, oh, you have capacity to help. So it could be an M&A transaction, you know, a company buying another company, or it could be a company that, you know, already has a good establishment and now they want to go public so they'll come to a law firm like ours and they'll be like we need our we need your help mm -hmm. so the lawyers will kind of staff so the partner usually has the client he'll uh, reach out to like a junior partner or an, a senior associate and they'll discuss amongst themselves on how to staff it then they'll usually involve someone like me and maybe a few students um, and, you know, we'll get tasked, like it could be drafting some ancillary documents, it could be assisting with like the main transaction documents, like the share purchase agreements, the asset purchase agreements, um, stuff like that. And then a lot of due diligence, right? Like whenever there's deals happening, uh, for example, if we're acting for the seller or the, or the purchaser, they're, they're going to have a lot of documents that they want us to review to make sure, you know, that the purchaser is a solvent entity and, you know, they um, have all their sort of documents in order to close efficiently. So that's what a typical day would look like. The hours are pretty long, right? But the flip side is that you put in the long hours now and, you know, just become the best version of uh, yourself that you can be in, in the legal capacity. Uh, and then you reap the rewards later. So I don't know if I answer that in the traditional way, but a typical day could vary. That's probably the short yeah. answer. Yeah. yeah, for sure. No, no, definitely, definitely. I think you answered the question. Uh, and Sister Summer, uh, what is your take on the question? Well, as an articling student, um, I, my day looks a little bit different than say it's, um, I'm at the bottom of the food chain. And that means a lot of research, a lot of um, drafting pleadings, um, a lot of phone calls. It's a little different because I get a little bit of everything in terms of, you know, litigation. I do solicitor work, uh, estates. So it's a nice, uh, diverse field that I, field that I get to um, look into. But at the same time, I know that post articling, my day will kind of look like, say it's where it's very long hours and 
um, you know, working maybe on a specific project as opposed to several projects. And I think with litigation specifically, the deadlines are a little bit different. So for instance, uh, you know, draft a third party claim in 30 days, whereas say it says, okay, no, a, a uh, agreement purchase, purchase and sale is due in three days, right? So I feel like there may be a little bit of difference in terms of uh, being a, a litigator or going into a solicitor work. Uh, and it really depends on what your, what your preference is and what you decide you want to go into. So I'm still undecided. So um, yeah, so far that's how my, my days look like. Mm -hmm. For sure, definitely, definitely. Um, so one thing I want to ask, uh, and a lot, uh, Sister Summer, uh, you go first. Um, so obviously you're still deciding and uh, I, I assume that you talked to a bunch of people. Um, so I'm just curious to know what's the best advice uh, you've uh, received um, while understanding the field that you're currently in? Yeah, I think I said this a bit earlier, um, work hard. There's no, there's nothing I can say that won't go back to that point because I'm, I'm working in an environment where there are two other articling students and, you know, we're all great people. We're all qualified. We're all working hard, but it really comes down to your work and your work will speak for yourself. So for instance, let's say I wasn't uh, wearing a hijab. I'm just, you know, I'm summer. Um, my work will, if anyone were to pick up my work, they'll say, you know what, this person did a great job here. It doesn't really matter how I look like. It really comes down to what have you done if you're able to portray your, uh, your argument in a certain way, I, I really, I feel like there's no other way to get around this. If you put in the effort, you will succeed. And, and that's advice that goes across all fields. And um, I, I think that's the best piece of advice I can give to anyone aspiring to go into professional fields. For yeah. sure, definitely. How about you brother Said? Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. Um, and the only little thing that I would add to this is, you know, you can really, really accelerate your growth by working hard and having good mentors, because sometimes you might be working really hard, but you might be devoting that energy in an area where, you know, it might not be producing the best return for you. So a mentor can help, you know, be like, oh, like you want to do this. This is where you should work really hard. Like it might be like, for example, the advice I got in, in when I when I went into 1L. I want to network like crazy. So my mentor sat me down and he's like, listen, you have to cut back on the networking. Grades are more important. So work really hard on your grades right now. Put networking on the back burner. Do like, you know, do an 80-20 split. And maybe during the summer you can, uh, you know, shift and network a lot. So I worked really hard to get good grades. And then, you know, I pivoted. And when I'm here, there's various different areas of law. There's different deals happening. So you have to continuously check in with your mentor and be like, this is what I want out of my career. How do I get there? And they'll give you a roadmap and, you know, you're going to have to work really hard, but, you know, just getting that foresight of someone that's been through the steps in the process. Um, it's kind of like, you know, uh, working hard as well as working smart. You know, I had friends in law school, great friends, much, much smarter than me did every single reading in the book. But, you know, when our grades would come back, their grades would be a bit lower because, you know, I tried to, and this was advice I got is understand that, you know, the professor is not necessarily looking for the textbook answer, depending on which professor it might be, but they might have like a bias towards one view or the other. So, you know, catering to the professor's needs, you still have to do all the readings and, you know, get all the points and uh, make your arguments, but, you know, um, working smart as well as working hard, that would be my sort of advice. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so we, is there anything else you guys want to say before we move on to the question and answer session? No. Okay. I'm okay. Uh, yep. okay. Summer? Um, so we have a good amount of questions. And again, I just want to remind everyone, um, that you can make sure to, uh, check the link, um, in the YouTube chat, uh, and leave your questions on the YouTube chat, uh, as long as on the Facebook live stream as well. Um, and we will answer accordingly, uh, as time as as time um, uh, permits us. So our first question is uh, very simple. How can you best prepare for the LSAT? Um, I'll let brother say go first. Sure. Uh, so it's been a while since I did the LSAT. So and my uh, studying methods weren't traditional because when I decided to apply, I only had a month before the deadline. So I, I think my friend sent me some videos. I watched some videos for the logic game sections. And otherwise, it was just 
practice tests. Like I think I did four or five practice tests. One or two of them weren't timed. Um, and then, you know, doing the non-time tests, you kind of get where you need to improve. And then I did a few um, time tests and luckily I got a good enough result to get in, but hopefully summer had a more traditional, um, you know, LSAT preparation strategy that could be helpful. Yeah, I would say my approach is kind of similar to yours. Um, I focus on, I would say one book in particular, uh, and I'll say it here, the LSAT trainer. That book gave me a very good understanding of every single section of the LSAT. And that took me, you know, maybe three weeks to read and comprehend properly. Thereafter, uh, I think I spent in total two and a half months preparing for the LSAT, which is not ideal. I would say definitely try to space out maybe four months. Um, and you have to know what you like. So for instance, if you're very independent and you work best studying alone, definitely do that if that's what you've been doing in university. But if you're the type of person that maybe having a mentor or hiring a tutor or joining those, uh, I believe there's like LSAT groups where you can actually benefit from a group study, then that's also another option. Uh, I found that self-studying was more effective for me personally. Um, and then when it came down to actually getting uh, the score I wanted to get, it was just through constant practice tests. I think I purchased 15 to 20 practice tests and just would hammer them out. Uh, if there was a section that was not as, um, that I was struggling with a little bit, I bought the logic book games. I believe they're called the, the Bible books or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I would go to the specific section where I felt like I was struggling, struggling a little bit. And then I would read that section. So I didn't necessarily read all those books. I did read the LSAT trainer. I, I focus on my weaknesses and my strengths. I obviously kind of kept to the side and just focus and narrowed down on what needs to be improved and how do I get that score to the score that, you know, gets you into law school. So uh, I would say you, you should time out, you should space out your time according to the time you have available to you mm -hmm. and how you study. Really, if you're a procrastinator, I would say don't spend more than, than three months, right? But if you're uh, if you need to have a plan, maybe six months. So it really comes down to uh, your personal preference. Mm -hmm. And the only one thing that, you know, I would add to that is the LSAT is something that can be learned and, you know, mastered. Like I've um, talked to various people, you know, at different stages and um, they weren't really happy with their initial score. And then, you know, they kind of revisited and tried and, you know, changed their studying methodologies and got an amazing score. Um, so it's definitely something that you should try earlier on. Like if you're already thinking about law school and you're in your second year or your third year, it doesn't hurt to, you know, a, either do a practice test or actually do a trial test. Cause a lot of law schools, they'll look at your best score instead of like, you know, um, your lowest score. So it doesn't hurt to actually get into that environment, see what you get, see which sections. And I think, um, revise your strategy accordingly. Right. So I think, um, yeah, that that's the only thing that I would add. And I would just add to say its point. Um, in my first year of, of uh, university, I wrote a mock LSAT test just to see, just to kind of experience uh, what it, what I could potentially be doing going forward. So that helped me mentally. I, I kind of knew what I was expecting. Um, I highly recommend doing that. Um, I believe most universities do that. So definitely look into it if that's if you do want to go into uh, into the law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure, definitely. Um, so just to go off that question, um, how important are your grades and extracurricular commitments for law school? I've seen both, obviously you guys both have uh, some in, uh, industry experience and also some uh, side industry experience. So uh, Sister Summer, I'll, I'll let you take this one. Sure. Um, I would say grades are very important when it comes to getting accepted. That's the reality of it. Um, Mo very, law schools are very, very competitive. There are only a couple of Ontario and I guess across Canada, there are maybe 10 in total. So it is difficult to get in. Um, I would say your last two years may be a little bit more important, but generally most law schools look at all four years and then you get a cumulative GPA. So let's say in the off chance you did poorly in a course, you know, maybe worth taking a, a summer, summer course, you know, or you know, focusing that next year and making sure that your grades are as high as they could be, because that's the reality. They look at your LSAT score and they look at your GPA, your cumulative GPA most, most often, or your last two years. Um, I think the cutoff, correct me if I'm wrong, Sayed, but I, I believe, you know, a 3.6 is sort of competitive or it should be, that should be like the threshold. I'm not entirely sure, but from my time, it was around that number. 
uh, on a 4.0 scale. So try to achieve a GPA in that range, but in the off chance that you don't have that grade, try your best to have a high LSAT score because that could balance your low GPA. Um, and in addition to that, your personal statement, once you're applying for law schools, uh, make sure that's the best thing you've ever written in your life because that will speak volumes about who you are as a person, what you can provide. And, and that's how law schools really choose the individuals they want. It's, the, it's, your, L, it's your LSAT score, it's your cumulative GPA, and it's your personal statement, as well as, as well as references. So make sure during your undergrad, you take a couple of courses with maybe two, two professors that can actually write something about you, right? So um, that's, my, that's my advice. Mm -hmm. I both say you want to chime in? Yeah, so um, agree with everything, right? But just the one thing that I want people to be mindful of is don't be discouraged, right? Try, try your best to get the grades that you need. And summer is spot on, like, you know, even at 3.6 these days, like, you know, it, uh, there's more people coming into the industry. So you got to keep it high, right? Like, if you want to guarantee your success, like, you know, aim for like a 3.8, 3.9, get a great like 165 plus LSAT score. Uh, but with all that said, I've seen good friends of mine that have done exceptionally well in law school that didn't have the grades, but you know, they put their best foot forward. They wrote an amazing personal statement, you know, and tied in their life experiences and stories, right? Because some people may have had, you know, uh, an emergency that they had to deal with, so their grades suffered, and others may have not taken school as seriously in their first and second year because, you know, they didn't know what they wanted out of their career. So don't let, like, if, if your grades are at a point where, you know, um, there's no chance to kind of fix them, still, you know, put your best foot forward, talk to as many people that have went through the process that can guide you and help you tailor your application. And you never know, right? Like sometimes it's just God giving you um, a, a hand. And, you know, I've seen many people go through that process that have gone in that didn't have the grades and they eventually ended up being very successful, right? There's no correlation like um, to people's LSAT score versus how well they do in the legal profession. These are just like, you know, metrics that they've put into place to filter out applicants and whatnot. Okay, sounds good. Um, so our next question is, uh, would taking a full course load negatively impact your academic journey? Uh, I guess it's more school related. So um, uh, brother said, I'll let you go first and then Sister Summer. So I'm working with the assumption that they mean like taking a full course load in undergrad like whether that's going to you know result in lower grades um that's how i'm understanding the question and i'll talk to it in law school too like you have to kind of be full time because especially in law school i'll start with that is you have to take a full course load because when you apply for jobs you're going to be competing with people that have full course loads right so if you don't you might have two or three courses and have a pluses in all of them but the 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 person that you know interviewing you or reviewing applications they're going to see that and be like well maybe the person that has all b pluses um is a much better candidate because they can work well under pressure and whatnot right so um you do have to take a full course load like obviously if there's exceptional circumstances which require you to take a part-time course load that you can explain that's completely understandable um other than that in undergrad i don't think uh, and Summer can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's, um, you know, a right or wrong answer. Like there's people that take a part-time course load in certain semesters and then, you know, take a full course load in summer. At some point, you're going to have to demonstrate unless there's exceptional circumstances that, you know, um, you are you can work well and hard under pressure and you do well, you know, when managing multiple responsibilities. And that's what the, app, uh, the people reviewing the applications are going to look for. But with all that said, um, I'm hoping that answered the question. But no, for sure. Yeah. And go ahead, sister. Yeah, no, your answer is spot on, my opinion. Uh, there are people that are mature students as well in law school. So if in the event you find that, you know, you need a break or something's happened in your life where you can't carry on a full time uh, workload or you leave school for a bit and you come back to school, there's still a chance to get in. It really isn't uh, black and white. Um, you can explain your circumstances in your personal statement if there are if there are circumstances to, to be said, but I would echo what Sayed said that you, you want to be competitive. You want to show that you can work hard under pressure. Um, you can balance life and work and, and school all at the same time, whatever the case may be. So I, I would highly recommend taking a full time workload. And don't forget that the process is very long: four years of undergrad, three years of law school. If you're extending, you know, part time, part time, part time, 
you really might take 10, 12 years to finish and it's not ideal. But if that's your journey, then that's your journey, right? So um, my recommendation is to take a full workload and try your best to, you know, shorten the time because it is a big portion of your life. Mm-hmm. For sure. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next question is, okay. So, uh, what would, and, uh, what would you say to someone who is potentially looking to go into law, like considering law, but they're not sure if they are passionate about it or they're a little bit like iffy about it. Um, uh, sister, somehow I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, I guess it depends on where they're at. So are they in university? Are they in high school? Um, I would try to seek out opportunities like I, I did. I did a mock trial in grade 11, grade 12. That's where I knew, um, that's when I knew that I wanted to become a lawyer. Um, but I would also say that in university, um, I believe I went to McMaster and there were a couple of law courses and, you know, it kind of affirmed that this is what I want to do. So I can't say for certain once you get into law school that you feel um, that you, you fit in this field and this is something you want to do. Some people actually take a different route. So always keep in your mind that a law degree doesn't necessarily mean you're going to become a lawyer. There are other avenues. So, um, I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's anything else that you can kind of get into to, to figure out laws, something you want to do, but definitely speaking to mentors, definitely reaching out to, um, you know, friends and family. And it really comes down to what you think you're able to do. If you're a good public speaker, if you have good writing skills, um, those are usually key indicators that you can be successful in this field, but that, those are not the only indicators. So it really is a test uh, for your for yourself. Figure that out. How about you, Brother Said? Any advice? Yeah, so um, completely agree with everything Summer said. And the only thing that, you know, um, I would sort of add to that is you can even reach out to law schools and be like, hey, can I sit in in a course? Like, I'm just thinking whether law is for me or not. And I don't know whether there's a process for that or not, but I don't see many law schools or even individual professors that would say no. And similarly, reach out to, you know, people in your network that are lawyers and say, hey, can I shadow you uh, for a day on the job? I don't know many lawyers that would say no, obviously, after getting like their client's consent, uh, you know, because you're going to be seeing some privileged information and whatnot. But most people take students anyways. And it's a great way to learn. And the the one thing is that a law degree opens a lot of doors, right? So I know a lot of my friends, like I would say 20% that are no longer in law, but that, you know, they've went on into business in different organizations, started their own companies. It's just people take you a lot more seriously because they know that, you know, you have the tools to kind of understand business, the law, sort of society and anything you end up doing, it just adds a lot more credibility. And um, yeah, if you're on the fence, the best way to kind of, you know, um, make your decision would be to see what a lawyer does and whether it's, you know, you like advocacy, so you want to do litigation. So you'll go shadow someone in court. If you like solicitor type work, you can reach out to someone like me and, you know, um, I'll pull up some precedents and send you some agreements and be like, this is what I do. I review these agreements. I, you know, make sure the party's interests are aligned. They're getting what they want out of this. And, you know, you can kind of see, be like, okay, like maybe this is exactly what I thought it was, or it, it isn't what I thought it was. Right. So yeah, that's what I would add. Definitely for sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, I think uh, you guys both touched on this, but um what is the atmosphere in law school in compared to in comparison to the traditional undergrad uh, in terms of what again academically, socially, um, um, the way that you conduct yourself? Um, and I'll let uh, brother say you can go ahead first. Yeah, so it is. I, I found it very different than undergrad. I went to UTSC for my undergrad, so um, that's just my, like I'm comparing that experience to law school. It's much more competitive, especially in your first year, because. Uh, you get marked on a on a curve. So essentially, you know, you're competing with your friends. And most people like to think of it that way. I uh, luckily didn't think of it that way because, you know, um, friends that I built my relationships with in 1L are now my closest friends. So uh, but the, the atmosphere could be very hostile um, and it depends what you make of it. You know, so I avoided the people that were, you know, very sort of type A cutthroat, um, you know, elbows up type of people. And um, I did well that way. But, you know, if you end up falling into that crew, you, it could really impact your, you know, uh, mental health and 
um, progress and success because you'll start comparing yourself. So the best way to do it is, you know, there's a lot of opportunity. Everyone comes into law school um, and you're all starting off on somewhat of an equal footing. And, you know, people want to join clubs and they recognize that, you know, it's your first year there. So you get you can get as involved socially as you like. And academically, like the professors are much more uh, helpful in that regard to, you know, open yourself up for opportunity. Like, you know, if you want to do a research paper or you want to help with uh, a topic that you're really interested about, you can reach out to professors and they'll get you looped in and involved. And, you know, everyone loves someone who's sort of keen on that sense to kind of make the most out of their experience. And law school does a great job at providing you with the opportunities, but you just got to sift through, you know, the um, sort of competitiveness and, um, the, uh, sort of the, like that atmosphere of it, but yeah. Mm-hmm. And how about you, Summer? Yeah, I agree with everything you said, Sayed. Um, it definitely can be a hostile environment. Um, my best advice is to make good friends uh, from the beginning. And um, it really helps to have a good group of friends for not for many reasons, uh, psychologically. <laughs> uh, people play mind games, unfortunately. Um, uh, I can attest to that. People can say, hey, you know, I, I got a, I don't know, an A plus on this when really they're just playing games with you and, and sort of to psych you out because it is very competitive and you have to navigate through that and figure out, okay, well, am I, am I going to let that get to me? Am I going to uh, just focus on myself? And really when you have a good group around you and you're not really caring about what else is going on in the law school um, in terms of that competitiveness, Um, I would say these friends not only help you uh, from a social standpoint, but when it comes to, for example, exams, you know, asking friends, hey, do you have a set of notes that you can assist me with? You can assist me with in in this particular course um, is very, very helpful. And not having those connections in law school, I find that it it is difficult to be successful. And I I think, Saeed, you can attest to this, like having uh, whether people, people that are older than you or people within your your class, having a few people that you can rely on, uh, if you miss classes, if you are struggling with a certain part of the course, having some of those notes or having someone to speak to about certain topics um, is very, very important because it's definitely not easy and it could get to you. And I've seen people, you know, struggle with law school just because of that hostile environment and letting, uh, I would call it the head game where people start playing games with you for the purpose of, uh, you know, maybe beating you in a, in a job interview. Um, so it really, it really comes down to what you make the experience. You need to figure out what you like and you need to figure out who you like to be around because it does, like, I'm still very close with everyone I made. I was friends with in one L. So that's my little network uh, post law school. So um, yeah, you need to navigate on your own sort of. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, so we've talked about more of the school aspect, but I'm, but, um, uh, bear with me one second. So, yeah, so I've heard much of the applicable learning for law happens more so on the job, uh, when you start working. So could you speak more on that? Um, I'll let, uh, sister Summer go ahead and then sister, but better say it after. Yeah, for sure. I think that having the ability to work hands-on is very, very important because everything you learn in law school is more or less theoretical. Uh, you can apply it, so to speak, maybe in a, um, I would say in an essay, you can apply certain principles, but once you're actually in the field, you're working on real life cases, you're applying the law, you're um, reading legislation and understanding legislation very differently than when you're in law school because um, you know you need to make arguments based on what you're reading. You need to, um, I'm trying to give an example here because it's very difficult to explain when law school is primarily just reading and and writing. Um, Having the ability to, for example, sit with clients, you need to have social skills. So once you're when you're in law school, you're not really communicating with anyone. You're just, you know, you and your professor. So having those skills and translating them into the work field, um, I think it's very important. Um, You don't really get that in law school. Um, In terms of work specifically, um, you know, I find that you need to have not only a mentor like within your work field, because once you go into the field, you don't really know anything. You're still technically a law student. Um, 
So on my own, I don't think I would have been able to navigate and transition very easily without having a mentor trying to teach me the, the tools to be successful and, and sort of speak to the clients in a professional way. Um, law school doesn't really teach you that um, in terms of even for going back a little bit, interviewing skills, you know, law school doesn't really teach you that. So you really need to reach out to people um, beforehand and, and try to figure out, okay, this is my plan. And, and it will all translate into a successful career path if you're able to uh, figure out what exactly you want to do as a person and what you want to achieve. And that can be translated, but it, you could also fall within the cracks. Um, if it's, it's very, I, I feel like Sade will be better at addressing this topic just because he's actually a lawyer currently. So I'm going to hand it over to you. No, you, you did an excellent job. Very little to add to that. In terms of, uh, you know, when you're in law school versus when you're in practice, it's completely different ballgame, right? Law school does not prepare you at all for, you know, the job, so to speak. So what you want to do is you want to definitely, um, you know, utilize all the resources at your disposal. You like when you get, get into a job, they know, you know, very little to nothing. Like, you know, the basic principles that you're going to use to, you know, do research memos. I did a lot of those when I was articling um, and, you know, um, assist with smaller tasks, you know, so all the skills that you've learned are going to help you, but not in ways that you know yet or know how to use yet. So, um, you know, most lawyers are very, very understanding of that. They remember being in your shoes and, you know, they'll sort of um, guide you and hold your hand and be like, okay, this is how we're going to do it. Like the first transaction I did, like I had an excellent mentor. He literally ran me through everything. Like we'd be on the client call and this is like a multi-billion dollar transaction. And halfway through the call, you'd be like, Hey, Syed, do you understand what's going on? There's like 40 people on this call and I haven't said a word. Right. So it's just giving you that support that you need and allowing you to ask questions and, you know, um, learning on the job, you're going to have to work really hard, but there's, Everyone knows that, you know, you know nothing. So they're going to give you a lot of support, a lot of tools. And if your workplace for, for, for whatever reason doesn't, I like 100%, you have to have a good mentor in that same industry outside of your work, right? Because there might be reasons you don't want to ask your firm mentor for specific questions, right? Like you might want to, uh, you might not want to look like an amateur or, you know, uh, for a lack of a better word, like, you know, um, stupid or whatever. But at the end, if you can go, and reach out to your mentor outside your firm, who's also a friend, they can be like, oh, like, yeah, like I had the same, uh, you know, question when I was going through the phase or this is the answer, or, this is where you should look. But the learning curve is quite steep in law school. That's one thing they don't prepare you for. Uh, apparently I'm hearing talks like Ryerson's program is going to do a better job at that, but uh, I think it's still too early to know, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Um, we have, I think, time for a couple more questions. Um, so in terms of the job market currently, I think since some of you talked about this, uh, specifically to Hamilton, but how competitive is the job market, especially with, um, COVID being the underlying factor, uh, brother said, I'll let you go first. So in my opinion now, which is very limited, of course, right. The job market for lawyers is phenomenal, right? Like I'm getting contacted by recruiters all the time. And like, you know, and I'm only like, five or six months out um, in terms of like practically being a lawyer. Right. So, but as a student, it seems very competitive and, you know, I, I struggled with this to a certain extent. Like, luckily I went through the a traditional recruiter, alhamdulillah, I was successful, but, you know, I know people that weren't and they continued to, you know, grind and apply and find that first or second job. But as soon as you become sort of a lawyer and you have enough experience, the tables turn. So, not only are you now getting contacted for legal opportunities, you're also getting contacted for business opportunities or, uh, you know, consulting opportunities. And like the world is sort of your oyster at that point. But with that said, in terms of COVID, I think it's only had a positive impact. I haven't been into the office since March of last year, right? So that saves me commuting time, time to get ready, you know, more time with my family. Like I'm much happier, right? Like you get pockets in the day where, you know, you'll send out an assignment and then you're free for two hours. So when I was in downtown, I'd just go meet up with a friend or do some extra work or, you know, um, figure out something to do. But now those two hours I can spend with my family or, you know, do something 
at home. Whereas, you know, when you're in downtown, it's much harder to do. And now, like, you know, I'm hearing a lot of my friends that were in Toronto. Now they're going to New York because New York salaries are uh, astronomically better, but there's no requirement for them to be in the office. Right. So it's kind of like with COVID, there's no more Hamilton, Toronto. I mean, it still matters, especially if you want to serve that community you're in. But um, as it relates to corporate law, you can sort of practice anywhere. And you want to add on to Sir Summer? Yeah, I, I think my perspective is a little bit different just because I'm quote unquote still a student. Um, I'm finding that because of COVID, some people aren't able to secure a, a summer job. So we're, now we're going back a little bit. I'm, I'm articling other people that are uh, pursuing a summer job. And for instance, my, uh, my friend's firm just cut the summer program completely. So it, it is, I feel like it will be, there will be negative impacts from COVID in terms of recruitment, but I say the saying, I feel like there may be more ben more positive um, outcomes from COVID, maybe in the long run. I don't know currently, but I would say maybe I'm going to go 50-50 on this. There are, there are, I would say COVID has impacted uh, the students more so than people that are already lawyers. For instance, I, I don't know if I will have a secure position maybe because of COVID. Um, there, nothing's guaranteed. And the firm, there are a lot of firms that actually shut down because of COVID. So um maybe that's different for Toronto but I know for Hamilton like maybe smaller cities there may be um there may be a bit of bit of difficulties in terms of uh, vacancies and positions for students okay sounds good I think I can squeeze you one more question because it's been spe specifically uh, requested for brother Sayed um so the the person asked I noticed you got have gotten your Jewish doctor from Osgood and I'm currently going into my last year this September. I'm pursuing a bachelor's in law and society from York University. And I was feeling really worried about my current chances of getting into Oscar with the marks I have. I'm a B plus student and I work really hard to always do my best. I wanted to ask how hard or easy it is uh, how, um, to get into Oscar Law School and how important having high marks is. Thank you. So just start my answer by prefacing that, you know, um, there's a lot of hype around different law schools, whether it's UFT, Osgood, you know, whatever uh, law school it is, right? But all of the law schools in Ontario and even Canada are phenomenal. And being on the other side now, like, you know, senior partners I work with have went to law schools, which, you know, as a student, I'd be like, oh, like, you know, never would have considered. So you're, where you go to law school is has very little importance, right? There might be like distance reasons that you want to go to Osgood or, you know, you might want to be closer to home. So, I mean, my advice would be apply broadly um, and wherever you get in sort of, you know, take that opportunity, but keep in mind. So my journey, so I went to Osgood, but I didn't get into Osgood. So I actually went to Windsor for my first year, which even now, like, I think Windsor is a much, much better school than Osgood. And obviously I'm biased because my 1L experience was at Windsor, which kind of shapes your entire legal journey, right? So with that said, like, you know, I feel Windsor was a much better school socially, at least for me academically, like the relationships I built with my professors were phenomenal. But speaking to Osgood specific advice, because, you know, I mean, spent two years at Osgood. I've talked to many people, a lot of people reach out. So, I mean, with a B plus, a strong LSAT um, and a great personal statement, you can definitely get in. There's nothing like I've seen countless people get in with those grades. But another you, you could take is apply everywhere, go to wherever you get in. And then after your first year, if you have really good grades, you can transfer, right? Like if you have uh, a reason to be in Toronto, that's very important. You can apply to transfer. And that's what I did. And, you know, uh, a lot of people do it. And um, that's another way to kind of, you know, be close to home and uh, sort of, you know, manage your commitments. But with that said, I think your grades are great. And if you reach out to the right people and put in a great application, there's nothing stopping you. But I would highly, highly recommend you apply everywhere in Ontario and Canada, definitely. And uh, don't let that stop you. Like, I always hear of people that, you know, applied to just Osgood and UFT and they didn't get in. And they're like, oh, I'm just going to apply next year. And next thing you know, they're like two to three years down the line. They're like, oh, shoot, like I would have been done law school by now, right? Um, and like I said, on the other side, it does not matter one bit, right? Like, like I've seen this with people that are three, four years out. Um, like no one has asked me in like three years where I went to law school, unless it was just like a social gathering and people were trying to connect. So it has very little significance, especially in my career. But I don't know, Summer, do you, uh, do you kind of feel the same way or? 
Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, it's a law degree and some schools are, are more expensive than others. That was one of my indicators. Uh, there is there is a difference in terms of where you live. Um, that could be expensive as well. The school could be more expensive. And there are only so few law schools in Canada that you really should be applying everywhere. That's that's my opinion. Um, and, you know, wherever you get in, you can assess what, what school kind of fits your your. I would say profile and what you are interested in and what where you want to practice. So, for example, if you're in Toronto and you live in Toronto, you want to practice in Toronto, maybe it is ideal to be in in a law, a law school like Osgood, right? So, it really depends on uh, I would say finances, it would um, where you get in and what your preference is and what your living preference is. For me personally, um, a law a law degree is a law degree, and Windsor was an exceptional school. And so are all the other schools. I, I can't even rank them, so to speak. And no one ever asks you where you went to. So uh, definitely try applying everywhere. That's that's my best advice for you. Don't limit yourself. Uh, okay, sounds good. Thank you guys, uh, both Sister Summer and Brother Sayed. Uh, I'm sure that all the listeners um, definitely um, uh, will take a lot from your advice. Um, so that wraps up, wraps up our Q&A session. Thank you all uh, once again. Um, and we'll move on to the final portion of the panel, uh, which will be engineering. Uh, we will luckily uh, have uh, with us both um, Brother Jawad Septi and Zahra Hussein. Uh, so Jawad Septi is a graduate from Lakehead University with a Bachelor of Engineering with many years of experience in structure design and project um, coordination. Uh, Brother Jawad is currently working at Acon Group, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, as a project assistant superintendent. Uh, Sister Zahra Hussein is currently working uh, towards her bachelor's in mechanical engineering and manager from McMaster University. She is doing a full-time internship this year at a power distribution company and learning to apply the knowledge taught in the classroom in the workplace. She aims to finish her degree next year and embark on a career path that allows her to combine both engineering and business management, inshallah. Uh, I would like to uh, thank both of you for joining us today uh, for this event. It's truly a pleasure to have both of uh, you with us. We can dive right into our discussion. I want to begin by asking Brother Jawad, what made you pick this profession? Uh, Assalamu alaikum first. Uh, I chose uh, to go into civil engineering because, uh, uh, to be honest, I have a lot of interest when I was young to build things that matter. Uh, it started when I remember it was very young, and I was passing uh, with my dad into like over a bridge. I'm like, oh, it's a bridge. We're passing over water, uh, over the river. And I, you know, I got, uh, I got uh, all the, all my, all my thoughts got pulled into that direction. How can we build things, right? Uh, in addition to that, my grandpa was a home builder. Uh, I used to attend, that was in Lebanon, not here. So I, I, I attended a couple of uh, of uh, a couple of their uh, like concrete pours when I was like I was young and I attended these ones. So it, it grabbed my attention since I was young. Uh, and uh, when when I started growing up, I got to know more and more better uh, about civil engineering. Uh, and even when like even before I get in, before I got into the, into into uh, the civil engineering. Uh, uh, civil engineering courses, I still had lack of knowledge of what is civil engineering. Uh, yeah, so that was the my like my childhood pretty much was the driven things to get me into civil engineering. Sounds good. And how about you, Sister Zara? Yeah, kind of a similar experience as Brother Joad. Mine was a bit later. I think I like grew more of an interest in high school. Um, and it was, I think, grade 11 and grade 12 physics, where um, I think they, I don't know if you guys still do this, but they make you make like a Rube Goldberg machine and um, just kind of those hands-on projects. And I realized that I really do enjoy that. Um, I enjoyed kind of applying that, that physics and like creating those projects. So that's when I knew I wanted to go into engineering. Um, and then McMaster has a general first year. So I had that first year of university to kind of decide like what, which type of engineering that I wanted to do. Um, and again, yeah, I enjoyed the physics classes. Um, I enjoyed, we had like kind of a design class. Um, I enjoyed that. So I knew that I wanted to do something that was hands-on that involved the physics um, and the math as well, I guess. But yeah, that was kind of what shaped um, 
my path for me. And yeah, and like Kamala, I, I started to do my mechanical engineering degree. Um, and now I'm working and I, and I do really like it. I like what I do is I, um, we design cable buses and, um, which is a lot of fun. I like applying that, um, that physics and actually putting it into design. Um, so it, it, again, yeah, it started from high school. I realized that I really liked, um, the hands-on aspect. I think that was the, the biggest thing for me. Mm. No, for sure. I, uh, it's good that you guys both find passion and meaning in your, um, work. Uh, so just to follow up to Zahra. Uh, I'm curious to know as to what your daily uh, your daily life is like at your internship. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I work at a small company, um, which means that like I work like very closely alongside the rest of the engineers. We're a small team, um, so usually you know you come in in the morning um, and like we're, we work on a project basis as well. So I'll have drawings from a company um, and like they'll have like their building drawings and whatever, and I have to then. Um, do the math and do any any type of like simple um, measurements from the drawings and then I kind of transform that into um, an uh, like an AutoCAD model. We particularly use Inventor but it's the exact same as using like AutoCAD or SolidWorks or anything like that. Um, so we do that and uh, that's pretty much kind of what I, I do. Um, we design those cable buses which is kind of like just a system to carry the wires from your transformer to like like a switch panel inside your your house except it's industrial. Um, and yeah, obviously there's design meetings that happen throughout the day. Um, those are also really fun. You get to hear the other engineers' perspectives. And as an intern, as someone who has like, who's just putting her foot in the door, um, it's really interesting to hear the other engineers who have been working in the field, um, how they decide to go about problems and like, you know, simple things that come up throughout the day, their solutions and what they decide to do um, and how they kind of problem solve. Um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much how my day goes. Okay, and uh, so Brother Jawad, would you like to uh, just give your two-piece on this as well? Uh, so I currently, my position is a project assistant superintendent with ACON. Uh, for the past two years, I have been in the Gardner Rehabilitation Project. Uh, I, got, uh, I got five crews reporting to me. So uh, on a daily basis, what I do is uh, I have to uh, follow up with every foreman about their work, the tasks assigned to them, uh, the very fine details. Uh, it goes like from uh, planning to the executing to uh, verify their work, to the follow-up, to, procure, to procurement, to, uh, to every single aspect of the work till, 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 till I get to the final product. So uh, this also includes um, uh, how we are approaching things, uh, the safety aspect of the work, uh, in addition to the manpower, uh, in admission, in addition to, uh, uh, in addition to the tools, uh, to every single thing. You, you want to name like any, every every single thing that they need to perform the work. I have to take care of that. Um, Besides, this is on a daily basis. Uh, that's what I do. In addition to that, in a weekly basis. Uh, I attend usually cost meetings, uh, scheduling meetings. I, uh, I, I communicate with the client uh, in case there's any, uh, any issue at the field. I have to be present. I have to give a recommendation and advices on how to perform and how to proceed. Uh, I have uh, I, pretty much I, I got I to gotta implement uh, all, uh, cons all the contractual, uh, contractual aspects of the contract. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, like I do, I do, uh, we do design, we do planning, we do management, we do costing, we do scheduling, we do uh, communication with a client, we do procurement, whatever you want to say. So this is pretty much uh, uh, when, when you, when you are a civil engineer, you gotta, you gotta think about it. You're especially I'm working for, uh, I'm talking from contractor perspective. Right. So we build things. Right. Isn't like you're in the office. I'm on the field. Ninety percent of my time, uh, 90 percent of my time. So pretty much you got to feel yourself that you are in a battlefield. Right. You got to take care of every single aspect. Right. You got to. There's always risk. Uh, you have to uh, have uh, pre-planned things and how to mitigate uh, how to mitigate uh, the risk or how to deal with uh, with uh, certain circumstances. Uh, so pretty much this is uh, my uh, daily, daily, daily activities. Mm. 
Yeah, for sure. No, I think it's really good that we're able to understand um, both the backgrounds in the different types of engineering. Um, so my next question I, I have asked to all the panelists is what is it like to be Muslim and be in the field that you're currently in? Uh, Brother Jawad, I'll have you go first. Uh, to be honest, uh, I don't see it as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as an obstacle or as, as a barrier to be a Muslim and be there. Uh, first of all, I'll, I got to tell you something. None, a lot of people, they don't know how to pronounce my name, right? Sometimes, especially because mo- whoever I, who I'm working with, they are, I'll say like from, they're, they're not Muslims. Most of them, like I'll say 90, 99.9%, they're not Muslims, right? They're, uh, they're Portuguese, Italians, Spanish, because they are the masters of construction here in Canada, right? Uh, they don't know how to pronounce my name. So I tell them, they, when they ask me, like, what's your name? I'm like, Jawad. They tell me, Jawal, uh, John, or whatever. I do accept it. But later on, then I, can't, I approach them on the side and tell them, hey, my name is Jawad. Uh, uh, but uh, my, my name is uh, my, uh, pretty much my identity. Uh, I don't, uh, I act like being a Muslim there. It's being a Muslim for myself, right? All my acts should be representing my Islamic uh, uh, practices, right? Uh, from being committed, from being honest, from being uh, straightforward, uh, uh, from doing 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 the job properly to the to, to the next level, right? Uh, so I see it. It's 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 it gets to be honest. Being a Muslim, be there in the construction or being on my field, it give. Uh, it's it's kind of uniqueness yeah it gives more responsibility to me to be honest because you have to build because you got to take an account uh whatever i'm doing might affect has it might have a social impact it might affect people life right because there is a risk if i built for example something that's strong and it fell or it collapsed or whatever like i have i have i have commitments right i have like i have to commitment to protect people right uh, this came from being a Muslim, right? In specific, then all the regulation, which I believe they are all taken, or all the, the Islam will encompass all the regulation that that are that are there. Mm-hmm. For sure, no, definitely. And uh, Sister Zara, how about you? Yeah, um, I have a relatively similar experience. Um, slightly different, I guess, in the sense that. Um, like I am a hijabi woman, so I am like visibly Muslim and I am like, I'm a mechanic, I'm in mechanical engineering, which is a very, very male dominated field. So to be a woman in general in, in mechanical engineering is a little bit hard. And then on top of that, um, to be a hijabi Muslim woman is also, um, it can be a little bit uh, scary. Um, I won't deny that. I won't deny that, you know, it's, it's not like, it is scary. Um, especially like even at work, um, the majority of people that we work with are like, you know, they're old white men, right? I hate to say it like that, but that's that's kind of what it is. Um, so it definitely is, it, it, it is a little bit scary, but alhamdulillah, I haven't felt like it's been an obstacle um, when it comes to actually pursuing my career or anything like that. Um, one thing I do uh, like the, what Brother Jawad pointed out is that, yeah, it, you are an ambassador, right? You, um, you're kind of in the spotlight, I guess, because like for me, I am a visible Muslim. So you have to try extra hard to make sure that, yeah, you're honest, you're ethical, you're hardworking and and everything, right? Because the spotlight is kind of on you, whether you like it or not. Um, Like you are a Muslim person working where, you know, most people, like you said, are not Muslim. Um, So I I did find that, yeah, I I do have to kind of feel like I kind of need to go the extra mile to show that, you know, um, like we, like we do work very ethically and we're very hardworking and everything. Um, and Islam does govern a lot of the things I do. For example, whether it's like fasting or whether it's praying during work hours, you know, um, all that is there, right? And um, it does show it, it, You like people know that you're Muslim and alongside all that, alongside the fact that I wear hijab and, you know, you have to pray and fast and everything, you're also very hardworking and you take your work very seriously and um, you take your career very seriously. And uh, yeah, I guess... In general, um, it is, I would say for me, not an obstacle, but just something that um, it, it makes the whole uh, aspect of stepping into the career and, and stepping into the kind of corporate world makes it a little bit scary. Um, but alhamdulillah, like it, you know, I think we're very blessed to live in like Toronto where it's already very multicultural. So um, not, it's not, um, it shouldn't, it's, it's not an obstacle, I would say, yeah. Okay, sounds good. I would like to add, I would like to add to what I said, well, what I said before. Uh, we are unique. We are unique there. 
and we should be feeling we are unique. Like I'll I'll give a like a very little example. Uh, I, like and 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 special being on the field and being on contractor side, in a weekly basis we celebrate things. Like we we bring, for example, we bring uh, lunch or pizzas, or by the end of the week we we bring something to the guys. Or there's a lot of parties going around there. Like after uh, finishing or approaching a milestone, uh, uh, like everyone right now knows I'm a Muslim. I, I just eat like for example, I don't eat any kind of meat. So, the, or I don't drink, or uh, even if there's a drink, they, they know that I won't be present there. So uh, they, they, they actually, they respect this on me. They respect, and I can feel like they treat me unique because of this. Like they, they, they I, 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 gained, I gained a lot of respect because I am practicing my beliefs and they do, uh, and they do like it. They do like it. And I feel like, yeah, I'm been, I, I got treated differently because uh, I respect my beliefs and I also, and I apply them. And even with, uh, uh, even, even like through the relations between me and them, I also like implement all like implement or uh, uh, practice the Islamic, uh, Islamic standard or, uh, or, uh, or uh, disciplines. So they like it and it's unique. You can feel them because as I said, being honest, not everyone is honest now, right? Uh, being uh, loyal, not everyone is loyal because as a, uh, uh, as uh, Summer, uh, Sister Summer said before that uh, people will be competing with you or they want to, they, they try to give you this, uh, this, uh, this impression that this thing has happened. However, in the background, there's something else has happened. No, I'm always straightforward and I'm being honest, even if it's going to be a loss for me or it's going to be whatever it's going to for me. I have to be honest and I have to be committed. No, for sure. I think transparency is very key. And I think um, going back to uh, Zahar, your point about having that footprint of being a Muslim, I think you guys are doing amazing uh, as being the industry leaders for the Muslims. Um, so my next question would be, uh, and I'll give it to, um, I'll give it to Sister Zahra first, um, is what is the most rewarding and what is the most challenging aspect of your uh, field? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think for me, the most rewarding part is, um, like, so where I work, we actually have a, like a shop or like a little factory right, right next to us. Like our, our factory is, or our, we kind of manufacture everything in-house. So it's really interesting for me to see, and it's very rewarding for me to see something that I kind of modeled on, um, Inventor or on SolidWorks or something like that. I kind of have it on the computer. And then when it gets sent out to the shop and I actually get to see those guys, like, form the metal and, and make it and punch it and everything and, and, and finally assemble it to what like I intended for it to be when I was designing it on um, AutoCAD, right? So for me, I think that's one of the most rewarding experiences. Um, and even like, like I personally don't go to site, but when it's off to site, a lot of times the contractors will send us pictures of like the fully assembled product. And then when we receive those back, it's, it's a very rewarding experience to kind of um, to see that the hard work that you did on the computer or on your like pencil and paper actually be put out into the world and um, in, in like a real life application. Um, that being said, that's, it's also challenging, right? I think one of the challenging things that um, that kind of hit me when I came into like the, the workforce is that the stuff that we do is going to be applied in a real life scenario, right? It's not like mm -hmm. where it's okay if you get a 60, 70 on an exam, because you don't need to be hundred percent. Right. Um, but in real life, that's, that's not really how it works. It does need to be, you know, hundred percent right for it to work. Um, so it is definitely super, super challenging to, um, to make sure that what you're doing is right. Obviously, you know, people check it and there's a whole process um, and like, it needs to be certified and everything. But regardless, I think that was one thing that was kind of super challenging for me to understand that, the stuff that we're doing is like going to be legit applied into the real world. Um, so challenging, but also super, super rewarding when you see it, um, when you see the final product. And how about you, brother? Uh, as I said before, uh, uh, I, pretty much I am, I'm involved in, uh, or I have been involved in a couple major projects and very unique projects. Like for example, uh, the rehabilitation of, uh, of the Gardner Express uh, project in the middle of downtown Toronto. This mm -hmm. is a very big thing uh, to have, like, especially I have like six, six, seven, six to seven years of experience. It's, 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 uh, it's a very good thing to have on my resume. Uh, so every, pretty much I feel like uh, 
I, and every single element that I constructed there, I have a memory, right? I have because I was involved in the designing and the uh, execution and also like in the planning and execution and all like to the final aspect. So there's, uh, there's a lot of memories there. There's a lot of uh, uh, kind of, you know, like w- one time I told, I told my brother, like, like you got to make sure you pass this to your, uh, to your uh, kids uh, that your uncle built this, uh, right? Or he was involved in build, uh, building this uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, main ro- main route of uh, the city of Toronto. Mm. Um, so uh, being involved in those iconic projects, uh, it, you know, it's it's you get that feel that you know, like of proud, right? Uh, sure yeah, like yeah, yeah, and especially like when 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 you go out there, there's nothing there. Then you start, you gotta you gotta plan, you gotta spend a lot of hours planning preparing and uh, uh and adjusting the plans again and again and then to get to get to the final product when you get to the final product it's it's it's, it's very interesting it's very 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 interesting mm-hmm. okay um so for our next question was uh and i'll give i'll let brother jawad take this away first is what is the best career advice that you've received um throughout the duration of your academic and a working career so starting from uh, while you are in school period, right? When you are uh, uh, during the school, uh, first you have to build relations with your professors, right? Uh, and uh, uh, for example, when 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 I when I was in school, I was just more fo- more focused into the, for example, structural designing, right? Uh, and uh, I was very selective in the courses that I took. However, I realized after when i when when i got to the field that during especially when you're undergrad you gotta you gotta you gotta be exposed to everything it's good to have like even if it's like a little piece of knowledge about uh, about about like uh, all aspects of the of the of, of the of, of your field it will be very very helpful later on so uh first of all when you're uh, when you're in school make sure you build good relations with the professors uh, uh, get as much as possible exposures to uh, to the all aspects of uh, of the industry there. Like for example, you don't need to be focused on structural engin- like structure designing. You gotta be uh, like it, it, you gotta, because when you go to the field, you gotta do everything pretty much. And that's what I have uh, been doing because it's 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 way different than what's 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 uh, during uh, school. So be g- get involved in the planning, management, uh, structural designing, infrastructures. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, just, just a second. No problem, it's fine, it's fine. Um, this is, uh, this is how would you like to take over? Yeah, I mean, he kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, I think that that's like, that's really, really solid advice, um, especially for those of you who are in school. Um, one thing I would add is um, make sure that you're doing something that you like. Um, and I think like you, you do understand what you like when you get all this exposure and stuff like that, right? But I think, yeah, one of the biggest things that I would say is uh, make sure that what you're doing, you enjoy. Um, because at the end of the day, like school, um, like in, especially in the later years of engineering, it, it gets really hard. Um, mm-hmm. You're gonna take some really, really challenging courses. And then it, it you know, uh, the workplace is different, but it still is, it, it still is challenging, right? Um, and if you don't like what you're doing, if you don't like um, like the stuff, the, the field that you're in, it's gonna make it just that much more challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know this is kind of like wishy-washy advice, but um, yeah, like I guess when you get that exposure, when you try to do different things, um, like Brother Joao was saying, you'll get a feel of what you like um, and what you wanna kind of do for the rest of your life, right? Um, it's a little bit scary to think about that, what you do, what like the career path you embark on, Obviously, you can change your career, but um, for the most part, like it will be relatively similar to, to what you do in school. So again, just to make sure that you enjoy what you're doing and you see yourself working in that, you're passionate. Um, and yeah, and then hopefully, inshallah, then your like your actual career path will be smoother. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Just, we have- uh, just I, would, I would like I would like to carry on with, with what I was saying. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, being at school, you gotta take that. Take as much as possible exposure because when you go to the field, civil engineering. I'm just talking in specific and civil engineering. It's very broad industry. Yeah, you cannot be specific to one one thing. However, you have to have this collective knowledge, everything, in order to be successful in your field, right? So don't say no to anything. 
like sorry any, anything they tell you like all right let for example if the manager or let's say your manager comes to you one day tell you hey i want you to do estimating go go there just be confident get involved with it get that exposure because this ex, this exposure will help you one day uh, evolve and 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 progress forward in your career so uh, the more exposure you get the better it is this can this can start from uh, your school and carry on with you with you through your career okay sounds good um, we have a, a, a couple a good amount of questions so I do want to get to most of them um, so uh, give me one second. Um, okay so okay so what so one of the questions that is asked is how competitive is the job market um, so sisters I'll, I'll let you go first and brother Joel, you can take it after yeah I think that um, that depends on uh, what type of engineering you do there's um, there's there's a huge huge job market for like software engineering is um, and I think even civil engineering has a really really good job market uh, mechanical engineering as well um, for sure there there is definitely um, a pretty solid job market um, especially like in in our area in the GTA um, whether like I haven't I don't have too much experience um, in applying for stuff other than internships so I guess brother Joad would have um, a better understanding of that but in terms of internships yeah like I won't lie it is it is competitive um, it, it, it is just the nature of, of um, the field. But there's always career fairs, uh, networking events, um, and there's a whole bunch of different options that you have to, to get your foot in the door. Um, and, you know, those, those um, your university or your college or whatever, they usually facilitate those things. So make sure you attend those um, and do what you can, um, network through LinkedIn or talk to people that you know are already in the field. And inshallah, that um, should help, um, like, better your chances. Um, but in general, yeah, I would say it is, relatively competitive but um with the right avenues it you should be okay brother joe i was to go ahead all right uh this is actually uh, i'm talking about civil engineering again it's uh there's a lot of uh, a lot of jobs uh, a lot of jobs out there more projects are coming from uh the government there because uh, if if uh, like during the pandemic we like we never got shut down because we were we we were, we were the only industry that's running uh, parallel with the the, the health uh, the health system, right? So we never got shut down because they needed us and they considered us as an essential. So there's a lot of products coming. Uh, there's a lot of work out there. It's competitive. However, again, I gotta emphasize and thanks for the new graduates and wh whoever is looking for jobs. Do not say, for example, I'll tell you when I started with Acon, they told me you gotta like I gotta go to North Bay. I went there. I went there. Uh, and uh, I had to finish that project because I got no other opportunity. So if you get the because, so if you get that opportunity to to get a job, however you're gonna be, uh, you gotta you gotta work away from home. Take that opportunity. This is a big experience for you. This is Canada, right? Uh, it's otherwise if you're gonna be very selective about uh, the career or uh, the job that you wanna you wanna take, you're gonna have it uh, very 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 hard, especially uh, especially like. If, if you're looking like for Toronto uh, and, and like, especially if you're looking to work in Toronto itself, uh, the construction is out of Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, there's very selective experience, people that they get involved in the construction uh, within the city, the major city, because it will require a lot of experience. Uh, it will require uh, also a lot of connections it will it will require certain knowledge uh, to for for beginners or for uh, for juniors it's it's better for you guys to look outside of the cities and mm -hmm. to accept those job offers if even if they are like four or five six hours or you got to be working away from home for for the uh, for the week you got to take it this is how you start and this this will get you somewhere okay sounds good um, we have two questions both specifically for both panelists so i'll, I'll start with Zahra first um, could you walk us through your academic journey? How was it uh, overall specifically? Uh, and could you specifically talk about your grades and your extracurricular commitments? Um, yeah. So um, I guess in high school, I don't know like where we're starting on this uh, academic journey, but high school was, um, I enjoyed the, the sciences. I enjoyed math and physics, which kind of uh, led me into engineering. When I got to university, obviously it is, um, it is a bit of a jump. Um, the difference between university and, and or between high school and university was uh, was pretty intense. Um, it took a little bit of adjusting, uh, but I'm like, yeah, like um, you, you make good friends and you make friends that can um, that can kind of help you out throughout your uh, university experience. That that's really good. Um, 
your grades at the beginning, like I, I won't lie, they, they will be significantly lower than what your high school grades were. Um, in order to get into an engineering program, you, you need pretty solid high school grades. Once you get into your engineering programs, um, they're designed to be challenging. So one thing that I would say is for those of you who are um, starting engineering or, or, or in engineering right now, don't be don't don't just don't be discouraged because your grades are a bit lower. The programs are usually designed for that. They're um, they're designed to be really really challenging, and a lot of times the averages themselves in like throughout the whole class will be in the, you know the sixties or whatever, and and that's okay, right? Um, the the courses are designed to to be like that. So um, don't be discouraged. Um, one thing that I think one thing that I do regret in my university experience is not getting involved in extracurriculars earlier on. Um, because it was such a hard adjustment from high school to university that it was kind of like, I have to spend all my time um, um, just studying just to kind of uh, stay afloat. But now looking back at it, I feel like um, I could have definitely balanced out more. And like later on in my university career, I started to kind of go back to my local mosque and volunteer um, at the madrasa and everything. And that's when I kind of realized that, no, like this balance is really, really important. Um, your social life, your religion and your university um, and your, like your education, there needs to be a balance. And I think that um, it's, it can be very hard when you're studying engineering because it seems like you need to spend all your time um, doing that. But one advice, one piece of advice that I would have is that it's okay to um, like your grades don't have to be um, super, super high. Um, because th that's, that's the way the programs are designed. Um, I know, like I know law school and stuff like that, th those are a little bit different, but for engineering specifically, um, I like my advice would be just, yeah, make sure you're, um, getting involved in extracurriculars. They don't even have to be engineering extracurriculars, but anything, um, just to kind of have that balance. Um, and yeah, then I decided to do an internship. So I'm taking a year off. So that's kind of where I'm at in my, um, in my academic and career journey. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, and brother Jawad, this, the question specifically for you are, is, uh, what is your advice on getting a co-op or job in civil engineering, in the civil engineering field specifically? It's a must. It's a must to guarantee uh, a job after graduation. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, let, let me talk about myself because this is, uh, this is, uh, this reflects uh, my experience. Uh, definitely, you know, in order to get into uh, uh, any any engineering uh, program, you have to ha you have to be good in math, physics, chemistry, uh, uh, and you gotta master them. Uh, uh, so uh, I I was very good in high school. The only issue with me was that uh, I had because uh, I came I came to Canada in 2006, and uh, I had to go through the ESL program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was kind of uh, uh, I, I was kind of eager. I want to get to the university. I want to start my program. I want to do this. However, because of uh, this ESL thing, I, I selected to go into college, uh, where I, like I'm, I'm very, good, I'm very practical. Uh, I have very good. I'm very good in math and physics and uh, chemistry. I went into Seneca College. I did the, the technology program for three years. Uh, I finished that. This gained me a lot of uh, actually again a lot of. Uh, 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 again, a lot of uh, exposure or uh, about about the whole industry because before starting before starting uh, this uh, the program, I thought that I thought that the, I only thought that engineering civil engineering is just involved in building uh, br like bridges and build and houses and high rise buildings, but no, it's 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 way different. It's way different. So um, so I went to Seneca College and after Seneca College. I went. I, I worked for a couple years, and those couple years, uh, those couple years, uh, you know, uh, again a lot of exposure into the practicality of the of the industry. Right? Uh, I, I was. I did some designs. I did uh, a lot of uh, uh, constructions. I was there in the field. I, I chose to be on the field, uh, uh, and this helped me big time in my university journey. Because then, after a couple years, two two and a half years of working. After college, I went to Lakehead University, mm. and there I, I I felt the difference between being uh, freshly graduated from uh, from uh, high school, going to university, and, however, like, and 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 being myself, like going to college, and then after college, going to uh, work for a bit, then coming back to university. I felt like very big difference, like where I had that knowledge. Uh, even like I, to be honest, I helped the, the professors, uh, like I, I like I, I shared my experience with them. 
uh, this helped me big time in getting a lot of good grades in university. I and uh, I and at end I ended up graduating with honors. Like my average, like like my average was like over eighty. So uh, this helped me big time. So my advice to to all civil engineers: focus and in getting into internships, into co-op programs because that's the experience. That's the experience. That's the actual. This is this is the actual degree. Being there in the field, this is this is the degree. Uh, to have just the theory, it will be you will have difficulties get, getting a job after graduating. No, get into have hand, hands-on experience, and uh, this will help you big time. And uh, to be honest, uh, uh, a lot of in my interviews that I did and I still do because I I usually get a lot of calls from uh, from um, uh, from employers looking for my experience because they 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 tell me even like with five six years of experience uh, however because you went to college with in addition to these five six years of experience you you are we 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 know that you are more practical you got more practical knowledge of uh, of just uh, recent or or or, or, uh, or graduates without any co-op experience. So mm-hmm. my advice to everyone: go for the uh, like aim uh, to have uh, one year or two years of co-op or whatever you can do or internship. This will help you big time uh, through your career journey to okay. start your career journey. Yeah. Sounds good. I think we have uh, one more specific and uh, for one for Zahra, and then we'll end it off uh, with one last question. Um, just give me one second. The question is, uh, what are the different uh, the industries that you can get involved in as a mechanical engineer and what made you pick the one that you're currently in? Yeah, so um, there are a couple different um, avenues that you can take. Um, you can go into the design field um, and that that is in and of itself, it is a broad field within mechanical engineering. Um, it can be um, designing any type of thing. It can be like designing alongside civil engineers, designing alongside um, electrical engineers. Um, that's one avenue you can take. Um, in my opinion, that like design will translate into anything that you do as a mechanical engineer, but um, specifically at McMaster, the way they organize uh, the courses that you can take is you can take specific courses that are um, very, very design heavy. Um, then there's manufacturing. Manufacturing is more um, like uh, setting up stuff for shops to, to build. So I like currently work um, in kind of in design and in a little bit in manufacturing as well, um, where I design, uh, like, we, like my whole company, we design cable buses. And then um, we also kind of work alongside the shop um, in terms of manufacturing. Um, and then there is also um, like HVAC systems, energy systems and stuff like that. And that's another field in mechanical engineering. Um, and that is kind of more like energy distribution, um, uh, power, power systems, um, like HVAC systems and stuff like that. That's a different avenue you can take as well. Um, the way specifically at McMaster, um, it is uh, organized in terms of your courses is you're gonna take courses in everything. And then in your third and your fourth year, you can choose electives that are specific to either design manufacturing or, um, or like energy systems. Um, particularly what I decided to do, like I, I'm doing this internship specifically in design and manufacturing. I'm not sure if this is like, I'm dead set on something like this. I do find energy systems um, also very interesting, particularly because like um, I have a soft spot for like climate change and kind of trying to do what I can to, um, to, to, you know, do my part in like, you know, helping the environment. And a lot of times feel like jobs in um, that energy systems industry involve um, coming up with cleaner and more efficient solutions to already existing processes and stuff like that. So I think that's really interesting as well. Um, manufacturing design, what I'm working in, um, also super interesting. If you really like the hands-on thing, um, I really, I really, really enjoy going, just going back into the shop and seeing what the guys are doing and, um, kind of seeing the work that I'm doing on the computer being translated into, um, like actual manufacturing. Um, so I hope that answers the question. No, for sure. Definitely. Um, okay. So this will be our final question. Uh, we have gone past our time, so I'll just give a minute to each, uh, as like a closing statement is what is, out of the entire panel, if you want all the engineers and all the people that are listening to have uh, to take one thing away um, and in terms of advice, what would it be? What is one like life changing uh, uh, advice that you could give to anybody listening at the moment? I'll, I'll let uh, Brother Jawad, go ahead. To be an engineer, you have to have hands on experience. So be on the field. And this is this is where the experience starts and ends as well. 
Okay, sounds good. Um, this is Zahra, how about you? Um, that's a that's a heavy question. Um, um, it's a little bit scary to answer that, but I think, yeah, I think going back to what I said, make sure you enjoy it. Um, and whether that means uh, like, you know, getting that experience while you're in university, doing those extracurriculars, um, talking to people who are already in the field. Um, I think, yeah, like just ensure that what you do, what you're doing, you like, because university towards the end, it does get challenging. And if you don't like it, it's going to be even more harder. Then it just continues on to your career, right? Like when you're actually working, um, you're going to be working 40 hours a week. You know, that's just how it is, at least 40 hours, maybe even more if you're working in something um, a bit more intense. So if you don't like what you're doing, um, it, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, so yeah, I would say like, if, um, if any of you are struggling to, to figure out either what kind of engineering you want to do or whether you want to do engineering in general, um, reach out to someone, someone who's already in the field, someone who's working and kind of have that chat about what, what it's like to, um, to, to work in like something like this, like a panel like this is perfect um, to kind of get your questions answered. Um, but yeah, I think my final thing would be just, just make sure you like it. Okay, sounds good. Um, so inshallah, we can wrap up our Q&A session. Thank you both. Um, I think all the panelists were um, great and I, inshallah everyone took away something uh, and maybe the, they'll uh, reach out to some of the panelists and people in general um, uh, and so we will now conclude our event once again a huge thank you to our lovely panelists for facilitating the discussion and for answering the questions posed by our viewers uh, it was truly a pleasure having you all join us and I'm sure our audience has taken a lot away I also wanted to mention that we do have a feedback form in the chat it will be in the Facebook uh, live stream and it will be on the YouTube chat as well. Um, you can also just DM us on Instagram or uh, Twitter, or whatever social media works for you. Um, and, I'll, and I think that's pretty much it for the event. We really, agree, really appreciate the feedback again. So thank you all so much. Thank you to all the panelists and all the, um, all the teams that, uh, and all the people that were involved with the organization of this event. Obviously, it takes time uh, and effort. So uh, I'm just the MC. So uh, thank you all so much again. Uh, Jazakallah khair Inshallah we'll see you in our future events Thank you Assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum Anta noor Allahi fajran Jitta ba'd al-usr yusran Rabbuna a'laka qadran Ya imam al